Fed's not going to move Wednesday. The bigger story is CPI. Does it really change the chance in a meaningful way the Fed really could cut this year? Until we see a weakness in the economy, or inflation really down to 2%, then they're just not going to cut. If they're going to lean in one direction or the other, they're going to lean towards caution before cutting too quickly. So they're going to try to do what they can to give an accurate picture of where they're headed. But the problem is that they're data dependent. If you become too data dependent and don't take longer term views, you end up risking real mistakes. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Equity markets at all time highs coming into Super Bowl Wednesday. Equity futures adding some weight to that rally. Futures this morning higher by 0.1%. Your lineup today looks a little something like this. At 8.30 Eastern time, CPI at 2 p.m., a Fed decision and forecast. 30 minutes after that, a news conference. One question this morning, how does this morning inform this afternoon? And just to give a sense of how how rare it is. The last time that we had a CPI print on the same day as an FOMC decision was June 10th, 2020. It has been four years since we have seen this type of potential double header. And it does raise a question. Doesn't the Fed already have this data? How much have they already incorporated this? Or are they going to be sort of rejiggering quickly all of their estimates as soon as we get this print? Well, it's all about the estimates. It's all about the dot plot at 2 p.m. Where is that median dot for 2024? How many cuts do they imply for this year? This is what we're looking for based on our survey. 41% of economists expect the Fed to signal two cuts. An equal number expect forecasts to show one or none. And apparently the difference between two and one, according to Steve Englander of Standard Chartered, is quite massive. Well, and he's not alone. There's a question about whether they're just going to do no harm. And that's basically the overriding concept. They're not going to materially shake up the markets. But if they indicate just one rate cut, how much are they basically saying to the market, listen, we don't understand just how restrictive we are. We are rethinking some of our estimates and we are pushing back significantly how much we plan on cutting rates. It will send a strong message. Do they want to send a strong message right now? Let's start with the front end of the yield curve. The two-year at the moment is at about 483. It is totally unchanged on the session. I just want to build on some work that Adam Ruskin and Deutsche Bank did for us the last time the Fed met. Four consecutive meetings of the two-year rallying on Fed decision day, and then we made it five. So we've had five consecutive decisions where the two-year has rallied. Basically, the conclusion is Chairman Powell has one gear. Does he show a different gear a little bit later? So this is the odd thing about it. We just had the 27th record high on the S&P 500, the 15th record high on the NASDAQ. We've seen this rally in bonds. And if you hear all of the different projections from economists, they're all talking about weakness under the hood. They're talking about how we just haven't seen it. Just wait. And there's this caution kind of pervading all of these analyst notes that we've seen for months that have not borne out. Does Jay Powell lean into that at a time where there still is a sort of underlying angst about the revival of inflation? The answer is no, because there's no way he's going to suddenly come out and overhawk the expectations because he has never done so before. Maybe he, maybe this is going to be a new pain speech, but it doesn't seem like a lot of people see that as necessary. I just wonder what the chances are of reopening the door to July a little bit later this morning. I know that's sort of a fringe argument, but we can have that sort of conversation a little bit later. We have got CPI later this morning at 8.30. You've got a chairman who's going to basically go into a news conference who, we know, has done this before. There's some daylight between him and the committee sometimes based on what he delivers in the news conference, what we hear from the Federal Reserve Minutes. And most economists on Wall Street, pretty much all of them, have thrown the towel in on July. Team September, City, Goldman, Morgan Stanley. Team November, JP Morgan, Santander. Team December, the likes of Bank of America and Deutsche Bank. You've got team no cuts at all. Apollo. Sockgen. I just wonder how some of this changes later on this afternoon. Especially if he says we're making good progress. We just need to see a couple more prints or one more print. Does that increase the odds? Just to give you to put some numbers on that, right now the chance of a July rate cut is 8% as implied by the Fed Funds futures. It's a 50% chance by September, so that's still firmly on the table. Uh, but we're looking at less than two cuts being fully priced into the market at a time where everyone's expecting they will come out and reaffirm some of their guidance, maybe taking off just one cut uh, from some of the previous expectations. I know the start of May feels like a long, long time ago, but it's not. And you have to remember what we were doing going into that news conference. We were waiting, oh, is he going to consider another interest rate hike? You know, what will he say about whether we're sufficiently restrictive? Straight out the bat, I think the first response to the first question in the news conference, he said, we are sufficiently restrictive. And that was basically the news conference over. We've played this game a few times before. Looking for him to be a hawk. 
and he never really delivers. Yeah. But in this particular case, and I guess that's the sort of tension right now between a lot of estimates from economists talking about weakness under the hood and then the record high after record high after record high in the equity markets, which is, you know, there's a real case to be made for that weakness. If he leans into that, he'll have a lot of support from that. You talk about the cracks that we've been highlighting, whether it's in commercial real estate, whether it's in the lower income consumers, he can lean into that. How many people are really pounding the table to talk about a sudden surge in inflation? Those people have kind of gotten quieter. So he can cater to these people without making an error in the minds of a lot of people. And the likelihood is that's what he will do. A few scenarios to consider throughout this morning. Looking forward to doing all of that with you. A lot of this will be dictated by what we hear at 8.30 Eastern time when CPI drops. The scores going into it, adding just a little bit more weight on the S&P 500, going into that data uh, by 0.1%. In the bond market, yields just about unchanged on a 10-year to almost down a basis point, 439.42. The euro firmer at 107.50. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Bob Dole of Crossmark ahead of CPI and the Fed decision. Bloomberg's Herman Chan on commercial real estate risks and Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho looking ahead to a new dot plot. We begin with our top story, the S&P 500 reaching a fresh all-time high before today's CPI data and Fed decision. Bob Dole of Crossmark writing this, despite all-time highs for equity averages with technical stretch, Little fear baked in and sentiment optimistic. We continue to expect volatility to pick up over the summer. Bob, I'm pleased to say, is with us now for more. Bob, great to catch up with you, sir. Walk me through what you're looking for at 8.30 this morning. Um, obviously, I'm data dependent, <laughs> like everybody. <laughs> oh, look, I have no idea what that number is going to be. We've had a string now of on-balance I wish the number was a little bit lower. I suspect we'll get that again. Uh, inflation has remained sticky, and I think we'll see more of that. Bob, you think that there's a risk here, a real risk, based on the conversations we've had over the last few months, that inflation stabilizes above target. Do you get the sense from the chairman that he shares that view? Yeah, I think he has to continue to work into that view. Look, absent a recession, the probability of getting to 2% inflation, in my view, is pretty close to zero. So somehow they have to back into the language that, you know, we've done enough, inflation's come down, maybe it's not going to get down to two. I don't know quite how they finesse that, but I think that's where they're headed. There's this issue of whether we're actually going to see that recession that so many people have been predicting. It just has been delayed significantly. And whether in some ways you think that we need that recession in order to get inflation back down to 2%, is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, Lisa, I think we do need that recession to get it down. Of course, the Fed doesn't want a recession, and they do want 2% two, uh, uh, 2 inflation. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's a tall, tall, tall order in my view. And they're going to have to compromise on one or the other. And I think what they'll compromise on is let's not worry about inflation down to two. We don't want a recession. So given that, how do you arrange your portfolio? I mean, basically, do you say long bonds are kind of really hairy here, given the fact that inflation is going to be what has to give, not necessarily growth? Yeah, I think, look, I, I, the, the, the uh, bond market itself, I think, has been vacillating, as you know, with that uh, trading range uh, that it's not sure either. I think we'll get more of that. In the meantime, the economy, more importantly, earnings keep delivering. And that's why stocks go from highs to highs, at least a few of them. How much do you lean into that, though, given the fact that you did just say at least a few of them and we're talking about NVIDIA and anyone who partners with OpenAI? By the way, who are they not partnering with? They're basically uh, they are what NVIDIA is to hardware. That is OpenAI to software. Bob, at what point do you just sort of follow their tracks and invest? Well, I think you have to be there. Uh, NVIDIA, Apple, Microsoft, uh, we own them, uh, maybe a little less than our benchmarks. Um, but nevertheless, we think you have to be there. This is a story. And while these stocks have been great, they're still not ridiculously priced compared to any comparison to the past. So you, you've got to be there. And as you pointed out, um, we're having a narrowing in the market. So the average stock is doing nowhere nearly as well as the broad averages. Hey, Bob, yesterday was a pretty interesting session. We had Apple at all time highs. Lisa, right to bring up tech, but also need to bring up the financials. Financials bottom of the pile in yesterday's session. Citi was down something like 3.7 percent. JP Morgan down by more than two and a half. What do you make of some of the concerns that we had in the financial sector just yesterday? Yeah, great point to bring up. Uh, that, that weakness to me uh, can be bought. 
Um, look, I think the financials are still pretty cheap. A lot of lending took place outside the banking system, uh, and therefore their balance sheets are better than you might think at this point in the cycle. Um, uh, and yet, uh, uh, credit worries are creeping into the system because the economy is not uniformly uh, moving higher. It's becoming more mixed. And that's a confusing period. You get you get the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing side saying one thing, the service side saying the other thing. How do you square that? And I think that's part of what the investors are concerned with in selling off the financials. We'll talk more about this a little bit later in the program, Bob, with an expert of ours. But there was a concern over at PIMCO that we're going to see more regional bank stress. There is a belief, I think, held by many that maybe last year's story is just last year's story. Do you think we've left that in the past? Uh, I think there's, it's inevitable we will have more issues, whether it's around commercial real estate or things related. Uh, not all financials uh, have perfect balance sheets. So, yes, we like the financials, but uh, we prefer the bigger money center banks. They have, tend to have less real estate, financial services, the visas and MasterCards of the world. How much are the big banks, though, exposed to some of the political risks that we've seen? In particular, say, some of the big European banks have really sold off, given some of the concern over what some of the new elections could mean for policies in the region. How do you gauge that? How do you understand how to insulate yourself from that? With great difficulty, Lisa, the only thing I think you can say is they're pretty cheap, so many of the risks probably are in there, but there's so much policy uncertainty. There's so many elections still to take place in this calendar year, uh, and we don't know which way. Take, take the U.S., for example. There'll be a big difference in the financial uh, outcome, depending on uh, who gets elected president, who's controlling the Senate and the House. Bob Dole, across Mark. Bob, thank you, sir. We don't know which way to look, so let's start here. Let's look to to Europe, and we'll talk about the prospect of a change in leadership over there. This from Emmanuel Macron this morning, the French president. It's absurd to think I will resign before 2027. Some concerns about that in yesterday's session. At one point, the French 10-year yield was up another 10 basis points. Finished the session basically flat off the back of the pushback that we've had from the French government. I want to reduce the deficit by growth. Lisa, that's what we're hearing from Macron this morning. And basically, you're not really seeing much of a reaction in the bond market uh, in response to that. So it's unclear just how much this is being receptive. That point that you made about reducing the deficit by growth is key here. You said he is open to social Democrat and Republican right proposals. Uh, the issue here is the potential for a downgrade. And we heard that from other people. France was just downgraded by some of the credit rating agencies. How much do they face another undermining of some of their credit worthiness at a time where this has been sort of the discussion for a long time, right? Growing your way into your deficit, and it hasn't really worked out in the way that many people would like. I don't want to hand power to the far right in 2027. The words of Emmanuel Macron, the French president, this morning in a news conference going into the G7. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie later on this hour. He is going to that G7, a weakened leader, in a big way. Most of the leaders who are going to the G7 are going to the G7 as weakened leaders. That's what I find fascinating. How many of them, what proportion of these leaders are really preparing to step down or potentially could get unmoored from their positions? It might be the last for a number of some of the key leaders. How does that color the discussion at a time where there is a more populist bent to what we see from a lot of the uh, electorate? in a lot of these regions. The France-Germany spread, still near the wide of the year. The French 10-year, the yield, 3.22. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The UK's economic recovery has stalled in the run-up to their general election. GDP was flat in April compared to the previous month. Economists had, though, expected a 0.1% drop in output. It is a setback, though, for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. He had been campaigning on evidence that the economy is turning the corner. Paramount Global shares down in the pre-market more than 2%. The drama continues. Chair Sherry Redstone has walked away from a deal to sell the media empire to David Ellison. Redstone rejected the latest proposal from Ellison's Skydance on Tuesday after lengthy negotiations. There are other bidders waiting in the wings, including Apollo Global Management, Seagram's heir Edgar Bronfman, and independent film producer Stephen Paul. Paramount is loaded with debt and is losing TV audiences. 
And helping the S&P rise to a record yesterday was Apple, shares soaring more than 7% to close at a new record high. The gains added $215 billion to the company's market cap, making it one of the biggest single-day value adds by any company in history. That record came after the company's annual Worldwide Developers Conference, where it showcased a number of features related to AI and, like everyone, an open AI partnership. And that's your brief, John. Thank you. More from Danny in about 30 minutes time. Odd session for Apple yesterday. In the morning, stock did absolutely nothing. All morning. Everybody was saying basically buy the rumor, sell the news. And then all of a sudden people thought, wait, emoji, my face, I'm in. 7% rally. Record high, <laughs> tightly ripped. Go figure. Up next on the program, property pain for regional banks. The Fed probably looks at the CRE situation and says, look, this is something we can't really address directly because this is a, this is a, um, a secular change in the demand for commercial real estate after COVID. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Fed decides. What data is important? What would it take to reintroduce the rate cut conversation? It's the labor market cracking that's going to allow the Fed to really enact some of its easing. Trust Bloomberg to bring you the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis, including Powell's press conference. Inflation is still too high, and the path forward is uncertain. They believe that policy is sufficiently restricted. And the Fed can only deal with the data that it has. Bloomberg surveillance. The Fed decides. Starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. TK, back around the table a little bit later on this afternoon. Fed coverage kicking off at about 1.30 Eastern time. The decision at 2 p.m. The scores going into it. Equity futures on the S&P 500 look a little something like this. Positive by a tenth of 1%. Yields just about unchanged. 4 39.81. Need to talk about the latest over in Europe. Macron, the French president, absurd to think I will resign before 2027. Bramo, the French bond market's not doing much in response to these headlines. French banks actually picking up in today's session. Well, that's picking up in today's session after an 11% decline since Friday, at least on Societe Generale. You saw all of the banks across the board pretty much hammered in France in particular, but across Europe, and frankly, there was contagion in the US. There is a question if there is uncertainty on policy on some sort of national or international level, that is the worst thing for banks. Regardless of what those policies are, the uncertainty makes it very difficult to plan ahead. That's Europe. We need to talk about the U.S. Under surveillance this morning, property pain for regional banks. The Fed probably looks at the CRE situation and says, look, this is something we can't really address directly because this is a this is a. Um, a secular change in the demand for commercial real estate after COVID. I think what they're watching more broadly is, are we seeing the effects of high interest rates? From that perspective, they're, they're probably justified in feeling that the, the policy rate itself is high. So here's the latest, commercial real estate in focus for all the wrong reasons, as one New York landlord sells an office building at a roughly 67% discount. PIMCO now expecting more regional bank failures in the United States, with many institutions holding tough to sell CRE assets. Bloomberg's Herman Chan is with us around the table. Herman, good morning to you. Good morning. This story sort of never went away, but it's back on the right. table in a much bigger way now. What did you make of that note from PIMCO just yesterday? Right. Uh, I think the industry is on a pretty solid footing, and despite some of the negativity in the headlines, there's a bit of divergence between perception and reality, in my view. Uh, the banks have very small exposure to office commercial real estate. It's about 2% of their loan book for the larger regionals that I cover. And the, the underwriting's been pretty solid, and we haven't seen a lot of losses come forth so far. That being said, there is a, a big maturity wall in 2024, about 200 billion dollars of office commercial real estate is going to uh, you know, mature this year. So uh, there will be potential bumps in the road. Let's piece this together. We'll catch up with someone a little bit later this morning from Credit Sites, mm -hmm. Winnie Caesar, who's going to tell us that this asset class is not a homogenous asset class. Right. It has its differences. Exactly. What is the difference between that building in Midtown mm -hmm. West and everything else you cover? Right. So the, the interesting thing is that office commercial real estate all gets lumped together, but the regional banks inherently are regional in nature. So they, they lend a lot to suburban office properties that are holding up a bit better than, than what you see in central business districts. So you have to go to the details a bit more to really understand what the exposures are. 
We're talking about this in part because some people are looking for the cracks, the strain on the system as we head toward a potential Fed rate decision, this question of restrictiveness that doesn't seem to be affecting the equity market, but certainly should have an effect on some of the uh, commercial real estate markets. And we've seen it, but it just hasn't been sort of codified or solidified by actually having sales. Right. There is a difference between saying that perception is different than reality and saying there are still a number of banks that have to either merge or will fail mm -hmm. within the next year unless there is a change in the rate structure. Right. Is it fair to say that there are still failures, they're just not going to be systemic in the same kind of way? I think there will potentially be problems down the road for some smaller regional banks, community banks that have overexposure to uh, commercial real estate, and also maybe haven't built up their reserves um, at like some of the larger regionals. So the thing with the, the worries about commercial real estate, this has been going on for quarters on quarters now. So banks have been building up their reserves, cushioning uh, their, their reserve and allowances in the event that losses do occur. So uh, there are some smaller banks that have less, uh, a thinner cushion, so there could be some problems. There's also this issue of a lack of forced sales. There just haven't been the volumes for price discovery. Mm -hmm. And if you start to get a couple of sales, well, all of a sudden you have to bark to market. Do you have a sense of who the rescue banks are at a time when we spoke to Bob Diamond, formerly of Barclays, saying mm -hmm. it wouldn't be in anyone's interest for another JP Morgan to bail out another bank? Right, right. so the next tier down of the large regional banks, uh, PNC, for example, has been pretty vocal about looking for potential M&A down the road to be able to compete for the likes of JP Morgan and Bank of America. And they've done a really good job extending their reach up coast to coast with a recent BBVA USA deal, but they want to get bigger. Um, there's other banks like uh, U.S. Bank Corp. that's also in the same boat. So we, we'd expect the larger regionals to really participate down the road. You know, there's a generation of investors that are somewhat spooked by this conversation. They remember a phrase and it sounded like this, subprime is contained. Mm -hmm. And when they hear people talk about commercial real estate, they hear it repeatedly on programs right. like this. Right. CRE is contained. Right. Again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that makes you think you might be wrong? Is there anything at all that's sort of on your radar that you think is something to watch? Right. Uh, really, if we get something other than office commercial real estate troubles, if it metastasizes to other areas like you know, multi apartment lending, for example, or if we get higher losses in areas like commercial lending, which we really haven't seen yet, that would create more worries, but the actual exposures to office seems to be fairly manageable. Let's build on that. And actually, this is something that's kind of controversial. A lot of people saying that it isn't the high rates where they are right now mm -hmm. that's going to cause valuations to come down. Mm -hmm. It's actually if rates get dropped, say, a percentage point, and get volumes moving again, and all of a sudden you get price discovery mm -hmm. in a market that's essentially been broken for a couple of years. Right. That's when you start to see the price declines. Mm -hmm. How aware are people of that dynamic? Do you buy into it that possibly when the Fed starts to move, mm -hmm. that's when it will catalyze some of these issues? Yeah, I think it's, it's a two, uh, sided, uh, two sides of the coin, what you're talking about. While that price discovery uh, would be potentially a problem, the other flip side is that you know, your, your refinancing costs are, are lower as well. So there, there could be a, a push-pull dynamic there that, that we'll still wait to see. Herman, this was great. It's good to catch up with you, sir. Thank you. Herman Chan there of Bloomberg. We'll catch up with Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites a little bit later this morning on this story. PIMCO pushing back. More regional bank stress still to come. And that building in Midtown West getting a lot of attention in the last couple of days. Well, I mean, the incredible discount that it was in Midtown Manhattan, given the fact that it was sold for lower than the amount of the loan, about half the price or the value of the outstanding loan, shows how much pain there could still be in terms of losses having to uh, be incurred by a number of banks. There is a distinction between systemic failure and individual bank failure. And that's what I think a lot of people are struggling well with right now, because it seems like there is more trouble down the pike and everybody agrees there are going to be banks that are not going to exist in their current forms. Question is, can it be systemic? And person after person says, no, 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 no. So it's not going to rise to the level of necessarily the Fed's attention on the flip sides. In other words, they're not going to necessarily cover all of these losses when they come down the pike if they're not going to break the system. You can say it's not systemic. It doesn't mean banks won't fail. Correct. And that's basically what we saw take place last spring. Are you ready to catch up with Anne-Marie in her vacation in Italy? Because we can do that next on the programme. Something a little bit more cheerful. <laughs> AMH in Italy as President Biden prepares for the G7. Anne-Marie has been away for, it feels like a lifetime. A couple yeah, of weeks now, enjoying, right? Enjoying the uh, southern coast of Italy with all of her friends. Told me she might not come back. Yeah, well, you know. We can't I still don't her. understand why we're not there. We can, why we are we here with her. for the Fed decision?
stop I mean, that why? I think that the Fed should decide in Puglia. So do I. Yeah, I think that it would be beautiful. You know, the ECB goes on tour sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of times a year. I think that the Fed should The Fed should do, should do a global do. tour. They go As Tom would say, yeah, yeah. central yeah, yeah. banker to the world. Yeah, <laughs> he would tour with bears. Just trying to, you know. Yeah, yeah, in Jackson Hole. <laughs> <laughs>
it'll basically be the Fed coming to the market rather than the market coming to the Fed. It's another one of those days when we'll spend the whole day talking about the dot plot of the Federal <laughs> Reserve. We've got the perfect guest for this a little bit later, by the way. The former St. Louis Fed President, Jim Bullard. For those of you that have followed the Fed for more than a minute, you'll remember that Jim Bullard was the guy that just put his dot at the bottom of the dot plot and just left it there for, for years. Just sort of sank it and just said, I'm not playing this game anymore. Yeah, he doesn't like connect the dots, draw by the dots. He thinks it's all silly and doesn't want to play. He is going to play with us, though, and I'm very excited that we're going to have him on, especially at a time where I know that um, someone in our world really is a boiler up fan. Oh, and yes, so, of course, you know, Purdue. Is, the mean, Purdue this connection. Is probably yes. part of the experience that we're going to be having is, you know, go... Go Purdue. Purdue, Indiana. I forgot all about that. So really? that conversation, yeah, oh, totally forgot. That was totally the reason why we booked him. Clearly. That's why he's on. Obviously. Does he know that? <laughs> Might do now. 90 minutes away, that conversation. Hopefully it's still going to happen. Elsewhere, the Biden administration looking to further restrict China's access to chips used for artificial intelligence. Bloomberg reporting officials are looking to target a new type of chip design used to process AI. It is still unclear when officials will make a final decision. Had a decision potentially from the Europeans today that we'll talk about a little bit later. Just looks like Europe the United States still pushing back against China's advance. The way that they're pushing back, though, is different. And I think that's important. And we're going to parse that through uh, over the next weeks and months uh, quite extensively. There's a question of an effective ban versus just making it a little more expensive, which is not really a ban, especially if the products are coming in that much more cheaply. There is this issue that the U.S. has, though, and this I would say uh, with Biden, he's proposing things that don't take effect that quickly and that don't have material kind of consequences in the near term, like electric vehicles from China. There are none that are coming into the United States. So how do you come up with something that has real world influence without A, jacking up prices for consumers and B, without destroying business for American companies? And that is an albatross a lot of, comp a lot of countries are dealing with. It's right election now. year. There's more to come. That's for sure. Elsewhere, G7 leaders looking to announce new steps on frozen Russian assets. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby telling reporters to expect new moves to help unlock the value of sovereign assets in order to help rebuild Ukraine. Anne-Marie is in Italy ahead of those meetings and joins us now. AMH, I'll save the questions on your vacation. Tell us what we can focus on in the next couple of days. <laughs> Well, this is going to be the main potential deliverable that the Biden administration wants to get over the finish line. When it comes to those immobilized frozen assets right now, this is about $300 billion worth. And there's been discussions for about a year on how they can use the funds from these assets to help Ukraine with Ukraine restructuring. And the issue is at the moment that they're still at the negotiating table. We've seen a draft communicate, but what's missing is the plan for how they will use this money. So what the U.S. would like to do is basically have this liquidity. What do these profits mean right now? The future of those interests, can they give, say, $50 billion worth to Ukraine? But the details, even if the political will is there amongst G7 leaders and Admiral Kirby saying they're going to get there, even if the political will is there, the details are really complicated. What happens, say, in six months time when the EU 27 nations have to renew those sanctions to make sure these assets are frozen and some of them say a Viktor Orban doesn't want to do that and throws a wrench in the process. So it's these difficult negotiations and we cannot really just assume that the elections that happened over the weekend are not making these conversations much more complicated. Because as you guys were already discussing, Emmanuel Macron comes here a much weakened leader. You have Olaf Scholz coming here when he's dealing with a lot of right wing politics at home. Some lawmakers in the Bundestag actually didn't even show up to Zelensky's speech on Tuesday. The issues European electorate are feeling have to do with immigration. You've talked about this on Monday and also the economy. And it does doesn't really match up to what leaders are going to be talking about in southern Italy in Puglia. And Marie, let's go there. Let's talk about how that's actually shaping some of the conversations. Yes, you're talking about the Ukrainian aid and how to get them. Some of the money unlock it from the Russian assets. That's those negotiations have been going on for a long time. In the past few days, how has the discussion on the ground changed, focusing more on things like what you just mentioned, like immigration? Well, the thing is, is that this is the one deliverable they want to be able to come to the table with and that they can as a G7 act. 
But at home, their electorate wants more focus on internal problems, cost of living, immigration. When it comes to immigration, this is something Georgia Maloney has been focused on. She's really the standout after the European parliamentary elections. She has a plan to maybe boost what it comes to energy and food in Africa. We're actually going to have Larry Fink and Siasia Nadella here talking about investment in middle and lower income countries, potentially in Africa. Some of this kind of investment to maybe keep more people willing to stay in the global south instead of looking to migrate to places like Europe and the United States. But usually the high level deliverables are done and dusted at this point. The G7 leaders come and they sign on the dotted line. But the issue you have right now, our negotiators are still at the table trying to hammer this down. And what happened over the weekend is just casting a little bit more difficulty. There's a little bit more reluctance on the part of some of these countries to sign up for, say, giving Ukraine another $50 billion of interest payments out of the future when they're not sure exactly how they're going to be made whole in the future. Come on, then. What are we missing? We got the short straw. How good is it in the south of Italy? <laughs> Puglia is the best. I'll just say that. It's one of the greatest coasts. You have two coasts on the heel of the boot uh, of Italy. And I definitely did not draw the short straw for this trip. I'll say that. I'm not jealous at all. MH, we'll catch up with you a little bit later. Anne Marie, with the Adriatic Coast behind her, having the time of her life for the next couple of days. You know, I feel bad for her. Do you really? She's, really, she's suffering. I mean, couldn't you see the suffering? It was just like pain in her face. Just seemed really unhappy, out of she, her element. She's going into Barry Vecchia, getting some Orecchietti <laughs> yesterday, enjoying herself, <laughs> but a gelato. Yeah, you know. My goodness. Geopolitics. My goodness. Spent all my summers there as a yeah. kid. Oh. Why am I not there anyway? All right. <laughs> Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The EU has notified Chinese automakers of an additional round of tariffs on EV imports. The European Commission says that they will range from 17 percent for BYD to 38 percent for some other automakers. They're expected to go into effect next month after an already 10 percent tariff currently. The higher rates will also hit Western car makers like Tesla, who export their cars from China to Europe. Europe, though the commission said that Tesla may get its own rate. China has already signaled that it's ready to retaliate, threatening measures across agriculture, aviation, and cars with large engines. Elsewhere in Europe, French President Emmanuel Macron is calling on moderates to regroup to defeat the far right after Marine Le Pen's party won big in the EU parliamentary election. Macron addressed voters this morning for the first time since he called for a snap election. He said it is, quote, absurd to think that he will resign before his term ends in 2027. Meanwhile, the French finance minister Bruno Le Maire says that if the far right wins, quote, a debt crisis is possible in France, a Liz Truss scenario is possible. Let's get you a check on Oracle shares this morning, up 8.5%. The software maker reported better than expected bookings and announced partnership deals with rivals. They did that after the close yesterday. Oracle revealed a new agreement to make its namesake database available on Google's cloud infrastructure. In another statement, Oracle also announced a partnership with Microsoft and OpenAI. The CEO said that she expects revenue growth to increase by double digits in the current fiscal year, ending May 2025, fueled by strong demand for AI workloads. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. We'll check in with Danny again in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, Dalvik into the dot plot. We are probably going to end up with two uh, cuts in the dot plot, but that risks are scooted toward that one cut. Most of the members want to keep optionality about being able to cut interest rates as early as September. That conversation just around the corner, just what is the difference between one and two? From New York, that's next. This is Bloomberg. Stocks on the S&P 500 positive here by 0.1%. Just a little bit of a lift going into the Fed decision later. And CPI this morning, 440.21 is where your tenure is. Under surveillance this morning, delving into the dot plot. We are probably going to end up with two uh, cuts in the dot plot, but that risks are scooted toward that one cut. And there's going to be the distribution will be interesting because it will show 
almost an evenly split FOMC between one and two cuts this year. Most of the members, which I think includes Powell too, want to keep optionality about being able to cut interest rates as early as September. So here's the latest. US CPI due out at 8.30 Eastern, serving as the last piece of economic data ahead of the Fed's 2 p.m. decision. Stephen Rusciuto of Mizuho saying this. The May payroll report and the solid rise in early earnings strongly suggest that the FOMC will trim the number of rate cuts expected this year from three to just two. The third cut is not likely to be dropped, but will be added to cuts anticipated in 2025. Steve's with us around the table. Steve, good morning. Good morning. Wanted to give you some space on this story. I think it's important Appreciate because it. we've all been obsessing over whether it's going to be three down to two or one. Are you saying there's not much difference? Look out 25. There really isn't because the forward structure of rates is what's been helping the economy along. And the Fed has been promising rate cuts for a very long period of time and promising sequential rate cuts. So therefore, as long as they don't change that narrative, the forward structure of rates doesn't change much. If it's three this year versus two this year, but it's four next year as opposed to three next year, what's the real difference if we're going to get to the same place in 2026? How do you think the labor market conversation is going to influence things on the FOMC today? Well, I think it should. Um, I think the, the continued strength in the employment numbers, um, I think, are important. I think the uptick in the unemployment rate that we've seen is also important to keep them wanting to cut rates. But it's nowhere near the level that suggests we've gotten back to normalcy uh, into the labor market. And therefore, it restricts them from going further in terms of policy at this juncture. So let's take a look at Nikki Leakes. Nick Timoros over at The Wall Street Journal came out yesterday with an article. It's always important to read him before uh, what we get, since he tends to have a pretty inside view of what's going on. His view is their best course of action for the Fed is to do nothing, make no moves, basically do no harm, make no surprises. And they effectively are taking the summer off to evaluate how hiring, spending and inflation are faring one year after they lifted rates to a two decade high. Will markets respond? to effectively nothing? Uh, you know, I think the markets have already priced in good news. You look at the way the market behaved with the 10-year note auction yesterday versus the three-year note auction. I think people have put those trades into the market already. Doesn't mean there wouldn't be a positive initial response to it, but is it sustainable from this level? That really becomes the problem. The markets are defining a very, very nice trading range. If you look at the two-year note, for example, okay, at 5%, you love to buy it. At 470, you don't want to own it anymore. Um, you're more willing to doubly buy at five than you are to doubly sell at 470 because the Fed keeps on promising rate cuts. So therefore, that dynamic, I still think, stays in the market. There's basically a buy on dip mentality created by the forward dots. And part of this is really hinged on this idea that the market does believe that the neutral rate is a bit higher than where we are now but not materially higher, and that essentially the Fed will cut rates substantially at some point, giving the extra fuel without having the recession that so many people thought was an inevitability. Well, I, I think you're right. I think people do believe that it's higher, but not substantially higher. I think it is substantially higher. This is where I do differ a lot from other people on the street. I believe the neutral Fed funds rate at a nominal level is 4%, which means that maybe they're 125 to 150 basis points restrictive. But given the fact that the forward structure of rates takes so much out, are they really restrictive at all? And this is why the economy has been so resilient, that plus fiscal policy, which has continued to be accommodative. We're looking at a $2 trillion deficit this year versus 1.5, 1.6 last year. And we're looking at an economy that has incredibly healthy balance sheets. So it's no surprise to me that the economy is resilient and will continue to be above trend this year. I feel sort of Neil Dutta on my shoulder, arguing in my ear, saying, are you kidding? There's a lot of weakness under the hood. And actually, the, the Fed will be making a mistake when they don't cut next month, because what you are seeing is weakness and under the hood in the hiring market. Lower and middle income families are spending a lot less. You see them curtailing some of that. You're seeing cracks in the commercial real estate market. We've been talking about that extensively, pressuring some of the banks. How much credence do you give some of these arguments? Well, considering the fact that we bought 15.9 million in automobile sales la last month, I'll sit there and say I think all those arguments are completely wrong. They're trumped up. They're made to look like that. It's easy to identify something negative, but it's not as easy to identify something positive. When you look at the claims data, the claims data are telling you nothing's going on in the labor market. The continuing claims data are telling you nothing's going on in the labor market. The payroll data is telling you the economy is very, very healthy. Wage gains are telling you the economy is very healthy. You've got an inflation rate here that uh, arguably year over year is either 3.5 or 3.6 after the Fed has had the curve inverted for how long in here? 
I mean, the reality is this economy has underlying strength. I can identify something and say, oh, gee, that's horrible. The problem is, is that liquidity disappearing from the system, or is it finding someplace else to go? And the answer is right now it's finding someplace else to go, and that's what's keeping the economy resilient. I've got visions of Neil Kashkari going into this meeting now, just pointing at that Bill Dudley opinion column from a week or so ago, saying sufficiently restrictive. What are you guys all talking about? What would change their mind? Um, only time. You have to remember, this is a group of political economists. Because they're political economists, they really want to manipulate policy levers. Okay? What does that mean, that they're a group of political economists? They're not anti-inflation hawks. Okay, they, they're, 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 Their concepts are how do we maximize social welfare by keeping a labor market tight, not how do we maximize social welfare by creating a, a consistent economy with 2% inflation. Okay, and allow the you know, animal spirits in the economy to take over. They want to get in. They want to monkey around. They want to be the garage mechanic who goes in and says, oh, let me just tune you know, up my little gas mixture on my carburetor to see if I can get that little extra horsepower. Uh, that's the kind of people they are. They want to play with the levers. They've spent their whole lives itching to play with the levers. Now they're in the position to do it, and that's what they want to do. And unfortunately, we've seen when that happens in the past, we create an inflation problem. Well, this is, is where, yeah. This is where I want to go. And actually, you pointed to this about the fact that the 10-year auction was successful. It was strong. And there's sort of a complacency. We've been talking this morning about, as John aptly said, the ghost of Liz Trust kind of circling around a lot of different economies and nations. How much is this sort of raising the specter of a sooner sort of, I don't want to say it, but, you know, a, a sort of realization in the bond market. I'll just characterize it, a Liz Trust moment, as a realization in the bond market to really look uh, at the deficit and the financing of it, as well as potential inflation going forward. You know, when you go back and look at what happened to George Bush, George Sr. Bush, he did what he needed to do in order to bring the budget to a better balance after the Ronald Reagan environment, okay? And at that point, we were looking at 4% real yields at the long end of the curve. Market paid no attention to what he did. Bill Clinton comes in and raises taxes, and suddenly real yields drop at the long end of the curve, and the Bill Clinton miracle starts moving forward. This time through, I think it's just the opposite. When we get past the election, and we see that we've got a two trillion dollar deficit and whoever gets in wants to make it three. I think that's when you can have that type of realization moment, which means over the balance of this year, the market continues to buy on dip. You think we've got an inflation problem going into that as well later this year? I think we've got inflation that's stuck at 3%, yes. And, and I worry that the combination of inflation being stuck at 3 not priced into the market, and the 2% real yields that's priced into the market when it should be closer to 3 are going to be a realization that unfortunately hits the market. But we probably wait until 2025 and we see that these people are really just willing to spend money ad nauseum, and that's when the bond market goes, hey, wait a second, I got a problem. We've got a couple of minutes left with you. What is the difference between 3% and 2%? And don't just say 100 basis points. What is the difference? How big a gap is that? There, there is not a big enough gap from a macroeconomic perspective. The question is credibility. Okay? The world is sitting here saying every central bank is credible on 2% inflation. So therefore, we've traded currencies on nominal interest rate differentials. Okay? But if the Federal Reserve is the lone central bank out there saying three, but I have to prove my three? that I'm really credible at three? Well, then do we start trading currencies on real interest rate differentials? And if we do, does the dollar go lower? If the dollar goes lower, then the inflation stories you've been having over and over again about the improvement that's taken place in goods prices holding down inflation reverses on the Fed. Then they have a real inflation problem. What's the difference between saying that they're going to allow inflation to move within a target of two to three percent versus say, just upgrading their inflation forecasts for the next year and the next year after that and the next year after that, but saying that we still have a, a mandate to get things down to 2%. Uh, really not much if you believe they're credible. The credibility becomes the issue. And this is where way you get credibility is when there is rampant fiscal policy excess. You create monetary policy restrictiveness to offset it. This is how you got inflation fighting credibility. When you're in an environment of when wanting to support the fiscal policy excess with monetary policy, you lose your inflation-fighting credibility. 
And unfortunately, that's where I think they're going to go in 2025. Steve, this was super valuable to get your opinion on the programme. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Appreciate your time. Steve Rusciuto there of Mizuho, looking ahead to the decision a little bit later and an interesting 12 months ahead. The ghost of Liz Truss's government, not Liz Truss. Liz Truss is very much still with us. Liz Truss's government <laughs> making its way around global bond markets. Did someone message you on that? No, I just wanted Liz to Truss clarify. Is still alive. <laughs> I just I wanted to clarify. A ghost. I personally just That's wanted good. to clarify. The Liz Truss moment, the ghost of the Liz yes, Truss moment, yes, kind precisely. of per, you know, hovering that's, over that's, things. No, but it's better. true. And actually, uh, what Steve is talking about is a really important thing, which is basically how do you maintain credibility while not achieving the target? for years and years and years. Sort of tacit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, coming up next, second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance with a lot to talk about. Savita Subramaniam of Bank of America, Bloomberg's Michael Shepard, Winnie Caesar of Credit Size, Scott Cronin of City. A lot to cover. 8.30 Eastern, CPI drops. That's not going to move Wednesday. The bigger story is CPI. Does it really change the chance in a meaningful way the Fed really could cut this year? Until we see a weakness in the economy or inflation really down to 2%, then they're just not going to cut. If they're going to lean in one direction or the other, they're going to lean towards caution before cutting too quickly. So they're going to try to do what they can to give an accurate picture of where they're headed. But the problem is that they're data dependent. If you become too data dependent and don't take longer term views, you end up risking real mistakes. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. CPI data is 90 minutes away. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now with stocks at all-time highs coming into Wednesday and adding some weight to that rally up by 0.1% on the S&P 500. It's a two-part story. Inflation later this morning. Lisa, the Fed this afternoon. And some people are looking more to CPI than even the, uh, the Fed since the expectation is that Jay, P Jay Powell will come out and do nothing as much as he possibly can. Nikki Lee sort of hinted at that yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, but there's this question of what really is the inflationary backdrop? We don't even have a sense of that, and you can make an argument on either side for that. So we spent the last couple of days talking about the difference between the Fed coming down from implying three cuts this year to two, perhaps one. What is the difference between two and one? We just caught up with Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho, basically said there is no difference. They'll just push it out to 2025. You have to look at the trajectory for rates beyond 24. You know, one of the bigger things to me today, and you've been talking about this extens extensively, is a statement of economic projections. How much does this Federal Reserve increase their expectation for inflation next year and the year after, akin to what we saw from the ECB, even as they cut rates, which is just absolutely anathema to most logical thinking? So there's this question of, does the Fed follow suit? And then do they have to raise their baseline neutral rate in some sort of way or give a nod to it? Do they give a sense that they're even entertaining these discussions that, frankly, are still pivotal debates all across Wall Street? So at 2 p.m., you'll open up the statement, gloss over that, then you go to the SCP, you'll look at growth, inflation. You'll also look at unemployment. Unemployment in the last range of forecasts has unemployment at 4% year-end. 4% is where we were on Friday. And I just wonder what they read into that labor market. Do they focus on what we learned from the household survey? or the establishment survey. There's more weight going one versus the other. I'm kind of intrigued on in how Chairman Powell's going to navigate that story. It's a great question because the way they interpret that, if they increase that even by a percentage, uh, by a tenth of a percentage point, there will be an interpretation in the market that they see more weakness. What do they see that we don't see? The answer is nothing. But the question is, the emphasis sort of opens more of the door to potentially cutting rates sooner. It's not that they necessarily have a crystal ball, but it might give you a sense of where the emphasis is, to your point, based on some of the conflicting information we've been getting. I think the chairman has basically already told us he's not too worried about upside inflation risks, is concerned about downside growth risks. And it's what he says about that today that I think is going to be really important, which is why people like Andrew Honhorst over at City are looking for a dovish news conference. Now, I know he's pushed out his rate cut over the last week or so after payrolls. What was it to September? Yeah. Something like that. He still thinks we get a dovish news conference today. Well, and he sort of is in line with Steve Rusciuto in the sense that it doesn't really matter when you start. It's the same number. And it's sort of the time frame uh, that you just sort of push out to next year. You do raise a bigger question here, though which is essentially how much they're looking at a potential economy that maybe the inflation isn't at risk of going higher, but what if it's sticky? And that, how do they deal with that? And that's sort of the question that Steve Rusciuto raised. How do we understand restrictiveness? Bill Dudley really raised that. Neil Kashkari's talked about that. Do they address that? 
in some of their commentary today. My guess is not, but we really hope they do because this is underpinning a lot of discussion. I'm just thinking of Mike Schumacher from yesterday over at Wells Fargo. This is a losing game. It's a losing game. Trying to predict any of this has been a losing game now for months. And we get to play it every single day. Welcome. This is Bloomberg <laughs> Surveillance where we play losing games. And we'll play it again at 8.31. Looking forward to that after CPI drops. Your scores look <laughs> like this on the S&P 500. Positive by 0.1%. In the bond market, yields lower by almost a basis point on a 10-year 439.62. One person around this table is very focused on debt auctions. Supply was actually decent yesterday afternoon. This was interesting. It was a $39 billion auction of 10-year notes. These have traditionally been really bad over the past few months. This came in very strong. Dealers took down a much lower percentage. Non-dealers came in with a much bigger percentage. Why? Are they sniffing out some sort of weakness or sort of disinflationary Is that your takeaway from yesterday? Yeah. So if it went bad, it's bad. If it went well, it's bad too. Well, it's not that it went bad. I mean, disinflation is good, but they might be sensing that there is a sense that there isn't the worry of the Liz Trust moment that other people think that there is Got potentially okay. out there. The ghost of the Liz Trust moment, not her. Yes, not her, because she's still very much with us, OK? <laughs> Coming up this hour, Bank of America's Savita Subramaniam and why the bears are looking through the wrong end of the telescope. She can translate in just a moment. Bloomberg's Ollie Crook as Europe announces fresh tariffs on Chinese EVs and when he sees her, credit sites on CRE risks to regional banks. We begin with our top story. Stocks at all-time highs. Ahead of today's doubleheader, Savita Subramaniam at Bank of America maintaining a year-end price target of 5,400 on the S&P and writing this. Data has softened, economic surprises are starting to skew negative, and if inflation doesn't moderate, the Fed won't cut rates. Stagflation is back on bears' lips. But zooming out, we see healthy, not recessionary macro trends. Savita's with us around the table. Savita, good morning to you. Good morning. What is looking through the wrong end of the telescope? What does that mean? Yeah, so I think that we're all focused on just what's happened over the last couple of years. And if you look at a chart, like pull open your Bloomberg and look at a chart from year to date or the last two years, it does show softening trends in most of these barometers. It shows that inflation is down, thankfully, from very, very high levels. It shows that delinquencies are up a little bit. Um, but then if you kind of take your fingers and squish that and zoom out all the way to, you know, a 50 year time horizon, which a lot of this data encompasses, things today are actually kind of awesome. <laughs> to use a technical term. And, and what I mean by that is we are at a delinquency level that's generally lower than where we've been in even normal cycles of the past. Financial obligations, same story. Um, if you look at jobs, we're in a healthy level, at a healthy level, but not super tight like we were coming out of COVID. So I, I kind of feel like there is this case to be made. And I know everybody hates the word, word Goldilocks, but we've talked about this before. I mean, everyone is so focused on what could go wrong. And I think it's because we've been trained by cataclysmic events that have happened in our careers. We've seen COVID. We've seen the global financial crisis. We've seen LTCM, Russia, Asia. We're all about crises and tail risks at this point, And that's our base case. I think the base case is something in between. I mean, if you look at the probability of a recession or stagflation actually happening, very low. 10% of the time or less, we get stagflation or a meaningful slowdown. Most of the time, we get some semblance of Goldilocks. So that's, that's the view that we're espousing, is until things really start to fall off a cliff, until we see broad spread job losses, until we see the consumer really deteriorate on all of these measures, it's not necessarily time to, to throw out equities. Can you make the argument that that story is already priced? I can't because, you know, what's interesting is that if you look at the spread between defensive or secular growth companies and the rest of the market, still very wide. So I would argue that folks have been forced into the equity market because it's run up and, you know, obviously forced into these seven magnificent companies. But there is a very uh, small uh, exposure to cyclicals. In fact, if you look at the beta of the average mutual fund right now, an actively managed you know, investor, professional investors, their beta exposure is at all time lows. That's not a bet on an up market. That is uh, a very defensive level of risk taking. So our view is the pain trade is going to be cyclicals, you know, p potentially companies that benefit from inflation, uh, not necessarily, you know, growth, tech, Magnificent Seven, et cetera.
That hasn't worked yet. That's it has the cycles. I mean, this has been sort <laughs> of one of the challenges. No, I mean, well, the, the, this is, that's not my point. But the reason why, <laughs> the reason why I highlight that is because it makes sense. If yes. you get this recovery, the cyclicals should do well. Right. They should deliver on earnings. They should deliver on forward projections. They haven't all. They so, kind of yeah. portray this sort of uncertainty in Absolutely. this way that really is hinged on the lower and middle income consumer. Why will that change? I think it changes. I mean, maybe it takes the election and moving past that uncertainty to get to get these juices flowing. But I, I think there is a lot of money that is sitting on corporate balance sheets or is waiting to be borrowed from banks on projects that are more must do than nice to do. I mean, if you think about it, infrastructure is super old in the U.S. There's a hasn't been a manufacturing cycle in a while. Now we're moving all this stuff back to the U.S. So companies want to spend money. They just don't know how to spend it. Should they spend it on EV or should they spend it on, you know, kind of what, what's the, the lay of the land after the election? Are we going to be in a, in a, you know, kind of a, a continuation of Biden's proposals or are we going to see something very different? I think, though, the idea is as time goes by and we see inflation volatility, rates volatility moderate, which it already has, companies get a better handle on what's to come and start to spend money. And that unlooses the, the cyclical drivers. Um, I just don't see the, the real, you know, kind of drivers for a massive recession playing out. It would involve major job cuts across the board. And a lot of companies are still citing that the labor market is very tight. So unless we allow free immigration or, you know, something massive changes in the demographic landscape of the U.S., it's hard to argue we're going to see a real kind of wage disinflation or deflation environment. And then when you look at CPI and just supply uh, constraints on, on kind of, you know, commodities, on food, uh, et cetera, we're still in an environment where I think that supply level of inflation is going to kick through and keep things stickier. I agree with your last guess. I think there is an argument to be made that inflation remains sticky and higher than what everyone's expecting and what the Fed is tethering their expectations to. And that's an environment where you actually want to own inflation-protected companies like cyclicals. What about, to John's point, valuations? Mm -hmm, Some mm -hmm. people saying that valuations are pre pre uh, presenting <laughs> the biggest challenge. How do you push back against that, given how much stocks have run up, or I believe on the 27th record high as of yes, yesterday this year? We, we are. And record highs aren't that unusual. I mean, the market normally goes up, <laughs> especially in inflationary environments. But, um, but look, here's the thing. I think... The level today, we don't have as much conviction in the absolute index level moving higher. And the reason I say this is at the beginning of the year, there were many more bears than bulls on the market. Today, there are probably an equal split of bears and bulls. So the level of the index may be capped right around these levels. And we haven't upped our target to anything beyond 5,400. But I do think that the internals of the market present great risk. And the idea is, you know, if you want to diversify your portfolio, you have to own something that's not working right now. And in my view, that's cyclicals, that's large cap value, that's where I have the highest conviction on a size and style basis. I think that in a few years, we'll look back on this moment as the moment you wanted to buy large cap value, dividend yield. You heard it here first. June 12th, 24th. <laughs> we'll come back in two years and see where we are. But We'll see you before then. But we will clip this and we'll play it back. Savita, good to see you, as okay, always. Thank great you. Great to see you. Savita Subramanian there of Bank of America Global Research with a price target just 25 basis points north, 25 points north of where we are at the close yesterday. Which is basically a sell-off compared to what we've been doing. I mean, well, I think that her point, though, about the internals is a really important one. Valuation is much more of a problem in a couple of stocks, not so much a problem uh, in some of these other areas that have been left for dead in a way uh, that defies the lack of recession that almost is the baseline for so many uh, so for so many banks. This is, to me, one of the biggest debates. Is the consumer rolling over or normalizing? You've put this very well time and time again. Basically, the wrong end of the telescope is chart crime because you're not expanding the uh, time frame long enough. A welcome calling or an unwelcome deterioration. Yeah. That debate's not going to be settled this morning, this afternoon or next at week. any point in the next week or so. Equity futures on the S&P positive here by 0.1%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Apple shares soared more than 7% yesterday to close at a new record and trade back above their $3 trillion valuation.
The market cap added was $215 billion. That's one of the biggest single-day gains by any company in history. That record came after the annual Worldwide Developers Conference, where Apple showcased a number of features related to AI. Former President Donald Trump met with several Bitcoin miners at Mar-a-Lago Tuesday night. That, according to the executive chairman of Clean Spark, Trump there told attendees that he loves and understands cryptocurrency. He said he'd be an advocate for miners if he retakes the White House. The former president has been increasingly highlighting crypto on the campaign trail in recent weeks. And is your GMT2 Rolex a Pepsi? or a Batman. It makes all the difference in whether or not your watch is gaining or losing value. The red and blue Pepsi model rose about 4% to $21,000 over the past year. Meanwhile, the one you're looking at now, essentially the same watch, but in black and blue, aka the Batman, declined 10% to $16,000. That according to Subdial data. The Pepsi was the original bezel color when it was introduced in the 50s and is still one of the scarcest Rolexes. And that's your brief, John. You've not heard of this before, Bramo? Heard of the Sprite? No. Like the green coloured one? Is Personally, I wouldn't like an expensive watch named after a soda brand, but it's, you know, it's a thing. It's nostalgia. It's sort of very, very, very expensive nostalgia. Childish nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You right. know, like socks that have Kit Kat there's on some, them. Or, there's some know. guys this morning looking at their watch as Bramo says that. There's this like childish nostalgia and they've got that sort of green yeah. Rolex on their whimsy. wrist. It's whimsy, apparently. Okay. See the valuations going down even more. <laughs> Stop. Up next on the program, <laughs> clamping down on China. We should definitely avoid any kind of trade war, because a trade war is neither in the interest of the US, nor China, nor Europe, nor any country in the world. But nevertheless, we have an issue with the unfair trade practices. We'll get the latest from the team here at Bloomberg. Ollie Crook, Mike Shepard on the other side from New York. This is Bloomberg. Controlled by Anne Marie on Twitter. Just seeing that. You seen that? Uh -huh. She's like sending pictures of food and the yeah. backdrop now. And talking about how difficult her life is. Okay, and yeah. How we should feel sorry for Super her. Super difficult assignment at the yeah. G7 and the south of Italy over the next couple of days. Okay. Equity futures on the SP look like this. We're positive by 0.1%. Yield to lower by a basis point. The 10 year, 439.42. About an hour and 12 minutes away from CPI in the US. And this event is this morning clamping down on China. We should definitely avoid any kind of trade war, because a trade war is neither in the interest of the US, nor China, nor Europe, nor any country in the world. But nevertheless, we have an issue with the unfair trade practices, with the high level of uh, subsidies, and with the industrial overcapacities. I'm the Minister of Finance. I will spare no effort to defend our industrial interests. So here's the latest. The European Commission announcing it's imposing additional tariffs on almost 40% of electric vehicles shipped from China. This coming as the Biden administration weighs more restrictions on China's access to chip technology used for AI. Our team coverage starts right now with Mike Shepard in Washington and Oliver Crook at the G7 meeting in Italy. Oli, talk to us about how this sets the stage for the G7 later this week. Yeah, Tom, uh, John, I should say, you know, this is the G7 meeting. It's all about multilateralism. It's all about getting along. It's all about sort of free trade. That is not the sentiment that you have coming into this now. Even the Biden administration with their Inflation Reduction Act, you know, that has been a serious concern for a lot of the, the people here um, in Europe. And what happened to all those conversations about friendshoring? It's all gone to sort of onshoring. This has been the focus. So this is going to be sort of the internal tension within the G7. Where they want to try to unify is to get on the same page in their messaging around China and that industrial overcapacity. But John, when Biden wakes up and slaps 100% tariffs on Chinese EVs, where do they go? They go to the only market that can absorb it, that is Europe. And Europe started this probe six months ago. They're much slower moving. So we've seen this phenomenon across a range of different issues and different commodities and items. For example, solar panels, where the U.S. throws up trade barriers. And where does all that capacity go? It goes right here in Europe. Before we get to you, Mike, Oliver, I do want to get your sense about how different what Europe's approach is right now to the United States. Essentially, they're not throwing up huge barriers. They're just saying uh, in Europe, it's just going to be a little more expensive to give us a competitive edge. It's not the same kind of full of teeth effort that the United States is offering, correct? 
Yeah, because there's also a lot more discussion within Europe, within the countries here, about kind of what they want to see. You know, the French have been much more outspoken uh, on, as we just heard from Bruno Le Maire on China. The Germans take a much more cautious approach. I mean, the Germans and Olaf Scholz said, you know, let's not forget that a lot of the cars that actually get shipped into Europe um, from China are actually European brands or Tesla. It has a huge factory um, over in Shanghai. This hits these companies as well, to say nothing of the fact that many of the huge automakers here, specifically on their most high uh, market items like let's say the Maybach and these kinds of cars they're all produced here in Europe and they go to China we have not had anything yet on retaliation but I can tell you right now having just spoken just moments ago with some of these major car makers in Germany that is what they are anticipating and they are now ga- game planning the plan B's and looking at their global pr- production footprint Mike uh, to the point of what we were talking about earlier which is a lot of the leaders that are coming to the G7 are coming from a really weakened position and are speaking about some of these highfalutin issues uh, like Ukraine, like geopolitical cooperation that are not reaching the voters. How is your sense that the Biden camp is going to try to message this going forward at a time where China is very much on the focus, where immigration is very much in focus, where populism is gaining speed? And one of them will be at sessions like the G7 in Bari, Italy, where they will have to speak to leaders and try to find that uh, degree of comedy and common ground where they can uh, find a a way to, for instance, stand against uh, uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine and find ways to try to uh, nip that in the bud. But they also have to message it back home with a little bit different tone. And that is where you see the messaging uh, coming in much more forcefully on China and on the things that Oliver was talking about, too, this idea of onshoring, trying to build up the manufacturing base here in the U.S., where a move like that will resonate with voters who are looking for jobs and who are looking for sustained economic growth. Mike, as you know, the president would have liked to have gone to the south of Italy to talk about leadership, multilateralism, the global order, the dark forces of nationalism in Europe rising once again and stand shoulder to shoulder with people like Emmanuel Macron. He can't do that in quite the same way, can he, Michael, particularly after what we've seen in the elections over the weekend in Europe? It's a much tougher position for him to take. And they're going to be looking for ways that they can at least find that little bit of common ground to maintain that unity. Uh, We are seeing the U.S. come out with efforts to curb Russia's access to the technology that it will need to produce the missiles that it's raining on Ukraine still. And they're going to try to message that more broadly with other G7 leaders that, look, we are trying to stand united. But it will be much more difficult with those uh, leaders in Europe reeling on the back uh, on their back feet, really, after this week's elections. Ollie, how do they recalibrate after that? Does George Maloney have a little bit more power after the weekend? I mean, completely, John. I mean, this is really a referendum for a lot of people on sort of the national politics, right? And Giorgio Maloney is really the only person of the G7 that walked away um, with a sort of affirmed hand. So she comes completely in the spotlight, really just sort of now having the chance to host everybody here. And let's not forget, this isn't just the G7. There's a, something close to G14. We have people coming from, you know, the leaders of Turkey, the UAE, uh, Brazil, Argentina. This is all coming together here to kind of be at Georgia Maloney. And with Macron, who is basically, as we just saw, a couple hours ago, basically running an election campaign, right, where he's basically touting the same things he's done in the past, saying that basically the center needs to hold. We have these sort of radical groups in France. The question is, will that work again? I mean, it worked the first time around, but it's part of the reason why they've done so well. He's weakened so fundamentally the two traditional pillars of French politics, of the Républicains and the Socialists, that now there is that void and it's being filled by the National Front. And this is Maloney's G7 in a big way. Ollie Shep, to the both of you, thank you. A Bloomberg coverage on a very different approach to China coming out of Europe versus just, say, 100% tariffs coming out of the U.S. a number of weeks ago. Let's sit on this for a second. This idea of what the tariffs actually are, they're not a blanket tariff of about 25%. It's different depending on which auto manufacturer yep. it's coming from in China. I'm trying to understand why uh, Geely got 20% tariff versus BYD, which is 17.4%. I mean, how Tesla's they come in up the with mix these? as well, by the way. Some Tesla's coming out of China into Europe. Which then is a focus of debate, and there's some discussion over whether they're going to potentially amend some of the tariffs on Tesla. How do they calculate some of these? SAIC at 38.1%. Is this sort of, you know, you're particularly overproduced, you're going to get a particular tariff, versus this one, 
versus what is a direct competition in Europe that could potentially be at risk if they slap a tariff on one company versus another? I mean, honestly, I it just it just highlights the fissures, frankly, in the discussions around this. I noticed how that conversation quickly went to Chinese retaliation. I think it's really important just to point out before we even begin to have that conversation, we were never talking about a level playing field here. I've got the numbers in front of me. The current charge on passenger car imports from Europe to China is 15% already. That's why so many manufacturers are in China. They made it very, very difficult to export into that country. So retaliation, I think maybe we're using that word a little bit too usely, loosely. The idea is, what if they get banned? Especially at a time where Mercedes, for example, has about 40% of their business in China. You can see why they're concerned. Correct. Sort of publicly on the yeah. record saying, no. we don't want this, don't go in this direction. But. Privately maybe saying something differently. Correct. Sure. From New York, this is Bloomberg. In about 60 minutes time, we'll be talking about only one thing, CPI. It's just around a corner. The score's going into it. Look a little something like this on the S&P 500. Futures positive by 0.15% on the Nasdaq up by 0.2. Little bit of a lift after closing at all-time highs in yesterday's session. Thank you, Apple. There was some underperformance, though, yesterday from the financials. And Lisa, I think that's notable. Especially given some of the political risk that we've been talking about, given sort of the uh, sympathy sell-off in the U.S. with Europe. I do want to point out that yesterday we got the 27th high, record high this year Still for the S&P, 15th record high on the NASDAQ. Apple, you were talking about, had its best day since November 2022. It added $215 billion to its market cap. How are we just sort of benumbed to some of these moves and how big they are? It's sort of everyday occurrences that we just don't even think about anymore. It was kind of bizarre given that we spent the whole morning talking about Apple and Apple in the pre-market was barely moving. And then for some reason picked up and everyone started saying, yeah, it was after the launch. Everyone was really happy with the launch. On the day of the launch of AI, I think we were down by something like 2%. It doesn't make sense. I mean, honestly, this doesn't sort of cohere, although people said, just wait, maybe Dan Ives got out there, put on an even brighter outfit and said, just listen to me, just be a bull, it's worked. I mean, maybe, I don't know. But either way, the fact that it jumped so much yeah. and that we can sort of shrug it off like, well, yeah, this is what happens. It's bizarre. These moves are not normal. This is a new kind of what some people would say is fragility in terms of how big the jumps are on a daily basis for some of the biggest names ever in the history of the United States capital markets. They're closing out the first half with two very, very different stories for Apple. Struggle to start the year. As we finish the first half, it's kind of picking up, getting better. Dan Ives wins round one, I guess, against Tom Forty of yesterday, who, who said, what did he say? He'd wear a green jacket. He'd wear the like, most obnoxious shirt. he'd wear the most obnoxious most colorful outfit in dan ives's wardrobe if there is some sort of increase i'm not sure in dan would use words like September. obnoxious and hideous Actually, but yeah you sure know, when you look at the new york post article about how yeah, he's yeah, the best, best dressed dress, man on wall street yeah he, there are comments like you know when my when my wife says things like you know i'm not gonna let you out of the house looking like that he views that as a compliment and then he said you know there's oh. really no rhyme or reason to his wardrobe he just picks stuff so out the more he upsets on. his wife the better he thinks it is? Yeah, it, like it, it works better for okay. making him feel It's an interesting good. approach to home life, isn't it? Well, I mean, you know, it's sort of the reality check of who I feel. Oh, really? <laughs> We've all been there. And then he knows that's a thumbs up. Let's that's go. Absolutely. Okay. Two thumbs up. I'm sure up. that resonates with a lot of men waking up this morning. <laughs> Let's turn to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Yields look like this on a two-year. We're just about unchanged. At, let's call it 483 on a 10-year down a basis point to 439. You've talked about it twice already this morning. Why not make it three times? Decent auction yesterday, 10 year, went quite well. Which is unusual. They've been going badly. And to me, I'm just wondering, is this basically people saying the whisper number for uh, what we get in about an hour time is that it's going to be a softer CPI print than headline? Is this basically the baked in disappointment or the baked in positive downward surprise that we had before the labor market report that was completely incorrect? But is that sort of what people were sniffing out? in what we saw yesterday. I want to turn to the European markets just briefly. We'll talk more about what Macron had to say a little bit earlier this morning. But the French bond yield started to come in just a little bit. We're down by three basis points. Went through 320 yesterday. Spreads between France and Germany on a 10-year maturity, the widest of the year. Just spooked by the politics. Maybe trying to undo just a little bit of that, but it's been a struggle over the last couple of days. How do you undo the uncertainty that this has introduced and the fact that even people in Emmanuel Macron's own party are saying this was a mistake? Why are you opening up this government to rule from a more populist, more right-leaning branch? 
he's basically saying, we're going to grow our way into this debt. Don't worry about it. I'm here. I've got your back. And as you pointed out, that's worth now three basis points. Three basis points lower on a French 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, all eyes on today's double header. CPI at 8.30, followed by the Fed rate decision at 2 p.m. The Fed widely expected to keep rates on hold, but there's less certainty over the so-called dot plot. So let's start with CPI. The estimates month over month for headline inflation, 0.1% in our survey. Stripping out food and energy core, Lisa, 0.3 is the median estimate in our survey. And what will be considered a bad read versus a good read? How big will the response be? And this is something that I know JP Morgan analysts have looked at that you could see about a one and a half percent swing up or down in equity markets on the heels of either a downward surprise or an upside surprise in CPI. Of course, all of this will be likely undone by the Fed news conference at 2.30 p.m. Eastern when Jay Powell comes out and says we're still planning to cut. Don't worry, we got this. There's a feeling, though, that this will set the tone for that decision, for the forecast, for that news conference. Do you not buy that? You know, this has been a Fed that's been talking about how there's sort of more than one month of data needs to be really factored in. They're going to have this data probably yesterday. So they'll already be factoring that into some of their outlooks. I'm just wondering, you know, if they discount an increase in inflation, that will give you a sense of how dovish they're leaning. And if they uh, really lean into some sort of disinflation, same, right? It will only be if they really just say, we really haven't gotten the certainty yet, and it probably pushes it back a little bit later that it'll get a reaction. We know where the bias is currently, that's for sure. This story popping up this morning, and over the weekend as well in a big way, French President Emmanuel Macron telling voters it is, quote, absurd to think he will resign before his term ends in 2027. Even if his party suffers in the snap elections, he's called for the end of the month. Macron's surprise decision to dissolve the lower house of French parliament coming after his far-right opponent, Marine Le Pen, won big in the EU parliamentary election. And some people think it was absurd that he called snap elections, given that this was in line with the polls. And other people saying that it actually is a brilliant way to get ahead of the no confidence vote that was coming down the pike from a lot of the parliament members uh, that might have undermined mind his ability to govern anyway, simply because it sort of ups the drama and sort of takes the onus off what he has done so far. He, of course, doesn't get to run in 2027. The fear is that someone maybe a little bit looser with fiscal policy comes into power, which I would use the word absurd once again, because this is a man who's been a little bit loose with fiscal policy, even though he's in power. But that's exactly what I was going to say. He's saying that they're going to grow into their debt load. This is what we hear everywhere. We've heard this for years. Guess what hasn't happened? We haven't grown into our debt yield because the debt load has increased at a much faster pace than what we have seen. My big question is, what's the fiscal response to a downturn in economic growth if you do have this deficit already? Which government official is going to say, actually, we can't help you, just suffer? I mean, that's not going to fly. So at a certain point, you have to wonder, what does this world look like as deficits go bigger? Let's run with this theme. I've always said... The cheat code to work out the difference between DM and EM is what happens when the economy goes south. In developed markets, you buy the sovereign. That's what you do. You see it time and time again in the US. That allows the fiscal authorities to be able to act counter-cyclically, so to speak, to respond to that. All kind of benefits the system. EM has a very different problem. Now, what we saw in Europe on the periphery, the likes of Italy, Greece, things went the wrong way, made things really, really hard to respond to economic downturns. France was sort of grouped in with, with Germany. We always considered them less of a hybrid, much more just a pure DM. If things go bad, yields go lower, the ECB cuts interest rates. Do you think we're closer to testing that for the likes of France? Because based on the price action we've seen over the last couple of days, there's some of the conclusions people are pointing to. This is the reason why Steve Rusciuto is brilliant. He was talking about how there is a credibility issue here for the Federal Reserve that has come with not fighting the fiscal impulse that dramatically. Because at this point, there is a question of what happens in that type of scenario. Does the Fed essentially monetize a, more, a greater fiscal impulse? In other words, do they buy an even bigger amount of bonds to finance and essentially just cancel out any debt so that you can still uh, stimulate the economy? You just put all this together. And it's the reason why there's a lot of anxiety underpinning what otherwise, on the surface, morning to evening, looks like a pretty confused and otherwise totally fine market. Lots of elections making it even more confusing. Let's put it that way. Indeed. PIMCO with a big warning overnight of more regional bank failures in the United States as a result of a, quote, very high concentration of commercial real estate loans. This is one New York City office building is set to be sold at a 67% discount from its 2018 purchase price. Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites writes in this, the bigger challenge of banking exposure to CRE is in the tail. Many of the regional banks have an outsized concentration of CRE exposure. This leaves smaller banks with less cushion 
to absorb default losses from CRE. However, it does help with systemic risk concerns. Winnie joins us now for more. Winnie, good morning to you. Good morning. It's good to see you in person around the table. It's an important mm -hmm. conversation. Lisa, I think earlier on this morning, nailed it. We have to separate systemic risks from just the prospects of banks failing. Banks can fail and you can't have the other. Like, that can happen. We saw that last spring. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through what's on the table with CRE going into 25 and going through the rest of this year? So with CRE, I think that the biggest thing that we miss sometimes is CRE is not one homogenous asset class. There's a lot of different things in there. And when we're thinking about the concerns in CRE, it's a very specific type of, of really office property. And so that's an even smaller amount of exposure. So yes, there's absolutely going to be losses in CRE over the next probably two to three years, perhaps even longer than that, depending on how long we stay at these elevated rates, how long occupancy rates stay low. But the, the big positive is we haven't had this massive over construction build. Bank balance sheets are not over leveraged to construction loans, development loans. And that's usually where you see the biggest losses. So there's absolutely going to be some issues within the banking system, but banks have been very proactive in trying to reserve for that. And the banks with more exposure to office properties especially have been reserving at a very rapid pace that's kind of outpaced the challenges within that uh, sector. I know a lot of people don't like comparing these things to baseball games, but let's just go okay. there okay. in terms of what inning we're in, <laughs> in terms of uh, some of the real estate re-reckoning mm -hmm. that a lot of people mm -hmm. are warning about. When it comes to commercial real estate, where are we? That's a great question because it feels like the first few innings of this baseball analogy were no hitters, right? They were just kind of fast and furious. We really hiked rates. We haven't seen a lot in terms of transactions to get a good idea of like where property values are. And now I think the, the game's gonna slow down a little bit. And we're, we're probably in already the fifth inning or so, but I think that the, the first few innings were played faster than the remainder of the game. And now it's gonna be a little bit of a, a slow play. What do you make of the theory that when the Fed cuts rates, mm -hmm. that's where you're gonna really see things be borne out in the market. When you're gonna see people solidify losses, mm -hmm. all those people who, and I'm not just talking about commercial real estate, but also residential, people mm -hmm. who've been locked into their homes will actually go out mm -hmm. and sell their homes, uh, albeit at lower valuations. Do you see that as likely, the idea that there will be more of a reckoning when rates come down? I think that if rates were to come down dramatically, right, if we're going to from five and a half to 2% in a six month period, absolutely, there's gonna be a reckoning because that would indicate that some sort of massive recessionary force has resulted in disinflation and the Fed is now chasing things lower. Our expectation is that it's gonna be a much slower game in terms of Fed rate cuts in general. And that I think would be a little bit of a slower play of the kind of reckoning of asset valuations in real property. We caught up with Bank of America this hour, who basically said we're looking at the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of paraphrasing here. We shouldn't be focused on a building on 44th mm -hmm. Street in Midtown West. We should be sort of zooming out. What did she say, 50 year trend line or right. something mm -hmm. like that? Exactly. Apparently we're in a great spot. Mm -hmm. Is that why credit spreads are as tight as they are and valuations and equities are as high as they are too? Yeah, I think there's a number of factors that are supporting valuations. The first is the cash on the sidelines. That's still a dynamic. It's being recycled out into other asset classes because that cash on the sidelines is throwing off an awful lot of interest that needs to get reinvested. The reality is we've gone through a pretty significant deleveraging cycle as it relates to the consumer, as it relates to bank lending, and that is just going to result in putting cash to work in other places, right? If we are not over leveraged, then there's just more cash that, that needs to be deployed. Can I just pick up on a point that you mm -hmm. just mentioned? Are you saying that higher rates are one of the reasons that credit spreads are so tight? Absolutely. There's the push and pull between the spread buyers and the yield buyers. The yield buyers are winning, right? Anytime you see a backup in yields, a little bit of widening in spreads, people get back in because they say, hey, investment grade at five and a half, six percent. Historically, that's a home run. I high yield at eight percent. Historically, that's that's a great bet. And you've also seen the higher rates shift the fundamental direction of management teams. They don't want to be over leveraging their balance sheets. They don't want to be doing massive M&A. So you like duration now, though, more than credit which is the opposite of what you've been saying for quite a bit. What caused you to shift? So I think that in the near term, we're looking for a little bit of volatility on the credit side of things. 
as the adjustment to expecting rates to be a little bit higher for a little bit longer hasn't really played through in those highly leveraged, lower rated capital structures in the broadly syndicated loan market as well. In the IG market, we still like taking credit risk. We're fine going down to double Bs even in the high yield market, but duration here looks really attractive for kind of the first time in a long time. We've been saying if the 10 year treasury is north of four and a quarter, four and a half percent, you should be extending duration in your portfolio. Winnie, this was great. Awesome to catch up. Thank to you. break down CRE and the broader credit market at the moment. Winnie Cesar there of Credit Site. So let's give you an update on Stories Elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Paramount Chair Sherry Redstone has walked away from an offer to merge her family's media company with David Ellison of Skydance. It ends months of drama and tense negotiations. Redstone had been pushing for a merger with Skydance over other offers, a deal that she believed would be in the best interest of her family and company legacy. Yet she saw months of resistance from management and shareholders, which forced Ellison to revise his offer. But now Redstone has changed her mind. With more than $14 billion in debt and a struggle to compete on streaming, it is unlikely that Paramount can stay independent. The EU has notified Chinese automakers of an additional round of tariffs on EV imports. The European Commission says that they will range from 17% for BYD to 38% for some other automakers, basically making a clarification on whether they're cooperative or not. They're expected to go into effect next month. The higher rates will also hit Western car makers like Tesla, who export their cars from China to Europe, though the Commission said that Tesla may get its own rate. China has already signaled that it's ready to make moves against them, threatening measures across agriculture, aviation, and cars with large engines. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink and Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella are among business leaders heading, heading to Italy for the G7 summit this week. Co-hosted by President Biden and Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney, they will support Italy's push to invest in developing countries. Microsoft and BlackRock declined to comment when Bloomberg reached out. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. That's an odd one, isn't it? Why would you decline to comment? I'm going to see them there. Well, it depends on why they're there and okay. who they're discussing things with. And I'm surprised Elon Musk isn't there, basically saying, really, you're going to tariff me? Where's my carve-out? Yeah, exactly. Excuse me, I'm American. Danny implied there would be a carve-out. We'll see, I guess. Up next on the program, mega forces at work. The mega cap trend, you know, again, not necessarily just two or three companies, but those companies that are exposed to these longer term secular trends like AI, like internet commerce, like cloud computing, they have further to go. That conversation up next, live from New York, this is Bloomberg. CPI data, 42 minutes away. Equities look like this on the S&P 500. Record highs yesterday, this morning, up another tenth. In the bond market, yields are lower by a single basis point, 439.22. That can all change at 8.30 Eastern time when we get CPI data. Under surveillance this morning, mega forces at work. The mega cap trend, you know, again, not necessarily just two or three companies, but those companies that are exposed to these longer term secular trends like AI, like internet commerce, like cloud computing, they have further to go. It is an example of investors looking beyond two, three, four, five companies and thinking about what are the other beneficiaries of this AI revolution. So here's the latest. Apple's AI surge driving the S&P 500 to a fresh all-time high as investors turn their attention to a double dose of CPI and a Fed rate decision. City Scott Cronin writing this. The market appears to be pricing a first Fed cut in December. City's economists have confidence in a September cut predicated on decelerating macros. All told, the S&P 500 continues to be influenced by the structural growth opportunity in generative AI as an offset to the mixed macro picture. Scott's with us now for more. Scott, I'm going to say it for you because you won't do single names on TV. But is this just another way of saying ignore the Fed and buy NVIDIA? I, I think there's another way of saying that that Wall Street's much different than Main Street and the Fed's influence is mainly a Main Street issue in terms of the economic activity that underscores you know, uh, U.S. equity fundamentals. We've heard it a million times that the equity market is not the economy. Is this S&P 500 in its current form a pretty good example of that? So we've done some what we call sanity check work on this. And if 
earnings solely fall, follow GDP over time, our back of the envelope is that the S&P would be worth 4,600, okay? So what you're paying in current levels, 53 and above, is gonna tell you at some level what you're paying for the expectation for growth over and above economic activity. And clearly this is being influenced by the mega cap component and the AI tailwind that it now has. What it basically says is that for those that think, my gosh, we're in an equity market bubble, um, I'd say, well, your downside is probably 15% in, in that regard. And when you step back and look at it with the new growth driver that we do have regarding spending on AI and other metrics around that, uh, the S&P is actually in a pretty good fundamental place. We've been joking, Scott, that the best bet right now or the bet that everybody comes on and says is they're having cashed NVIDIA, and that's essentially the barbell approach that they've been taking, or basically tech uh, and big tech stocks that are generating a lot of cash and then cash itself. And that's the approach to take in a macroeconomic environment that is highly uncertain. How concerned are you about this type of behavior leading to real crowding in a specific number of stocks? You know, Lisa, I think it's a really good point. We're obviously very concerned about crowding, but what I would say so far is that uh, you look at valuations, got it, but when you look at peg ratios, which is your PE over growth, it turns out that your peg ratios have actually come down. So what's been happening is that the underlying earnings expectations for these mega cap growers have actually been supporting the price action and the valuations. Now, to your earlier point, though, um, it's, it's it, whether you want to call it a joke, but I think it's reality is that is that you're right. Um, what you have is a, a Fed policy circumstance that ha is at risk of unintended consequences. So in, on Main Street, if you're a, no a non-saver, you've got issues. You've got higher inflation that presumably is coming down now and now higher interest rates. That's a much different setup than if you're a, a saver and you're now earning a decent return on your cash, which is much different than prior to COVID. It's the same thing in corporate America. So the mega cap growth tech part of the market does tend to carry lower debt, more cash. That's a market different discussion from looking at sectors like commercial real estate or real estate and utilities, staples, parts of industrials, where they do tend to be more debt, uh, debt laden. So the fact here is that the Fed, whether it's intended or not, is providing a different type of headwind and tailwind to different parts of the economy and different parts of the stock market. If the Fed were to start cutting rates, would that make you more constructive on these other areas or would it kind of depend? It kind of depends. So the other work that we've done recently basically says if you were to cut 200 basis points of, of Fed rates over the next year, um, that would create all things equal, a roughly 1.7% earnings drag on the S&P 500. Essentially, those mega cap growth companies uh, would lose uh, less, in, would, would lose more in, uh, in, in their cash income than they would in what they pay on their debt. So, you know, it's a bit of a circuitous argument on this. But as you go down cap, as you go down into small mid cap, this is where now you begin to trade more aligned with the underlying economy. You don't have that mega cap influence in small mid by almost by definition or implication. You've got a lesser tech weight. You've got higher industrials exposure. You're more economically sensitive. At the margin, small mid cap would benefit from, from, a, from a rate shift. But the perspective here is that historically, when we've gone into more prolonged periods of Fed ease, it's usually been on the other side of recession. And during those recessions, you tend to, to, to have a, a major drawdown in earnings. We don't think we're looking at that right now. So it is a more mixed picture this time, Lisa. Scott, before you go, I just wanted to mention the Pulse Monitor that you and the team put out and pick out the S. An opportunity, of course, to talk about the late great Tobias Lefkovich as well. Can you talk to us about where sentiment is right now, Scott? Because it feels like on this program, one minute everyone's bearish, the next minute they're super bullish. And it changes day to day. Yeah. Where are we? Well, our sentiment read, we're, we're in euphoria. We've been there for a couple of weeks now. We've been in and out, right? So we went clearly into euphoria at the end of Q1. We had that April pullback, pulled us back out of euphoria. Now we're back in. Uh, the way we're spinning it around, John, is that we're, we're focused a, a bit more on your cross-asset valuation work, which off of this recent rally, what it, what it has done is begun to switch the cross-asset valuation a little bit more in favor of bonds. And so the combination of that, um, where we're trading versus our estimates of fair value for the S&P and the uh, Lefkovich index, 
all suggest to us that we're looking at a market that's due for a bit of a digestion in here. But that's a different discussion than the longer term fundamental setup, which we still think looks pretty good. Scott, you're one of the best. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, sir. Scott Cronut there of City. Some more from City this morning. Andrew Honhorst just published in moments ago. Median dot showing 225 basis point cuts and Powell emphasising the rise in the unemployment rate and drop in job openings would emphasise the dovish message that the team at City are looking for in this press conference. Well, he uh, has been talking about, Andrew Hollenhorst and the team has been talking about the fact that even though they're pushing back their cut, their first cut expectation to September from July, they still kind of expect, expect the same framework and the Fed to respond to it in that way. Isn't this kind of what everybody's expecting today? We'll see. We'll see what other people say in the next hour after we get CPI at 8.30 in yeah. about 35 minutes. What did you call it, the losing game? It is a losing game. Yeah, I know. Things can change. You want to talk about the dot plot? We'll talk to a man that hates it much more than you do. <laughs> I can't wait. The former St. Louis Fed president, Jim Bullard, is going to join us in just a moment. The perfect setup for inflation and Fed Day alongside Bloomberg's Ira Jersey and Francis Donald of Man Your Life. All of that coming up from New York City this morning. Good morning. You know, we see that trends in inflation are exactly where the Fed wants it to be. It's going to be very difficult for policymakers to get excited about a rate cut unless CPI actually is decent. One message you're going to get from Chair Powell, this is not about the year-over-year -year rate of change in inflation. It's the sequential monthly pace. If you get a point two, then it's a reasonable conversation to have about a July cut. Fed cuts, preemptive cuts, are essential for the soft landing to continue. If inflation doesn't let them do that, I think then we're looking at a bigger slowdown. This is Blue. Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. In many ways, this is like the Super Bowl. It will last about six hours. 8.30, you get CPI. Six hours later, you'll have a Fed decision, some projections, and the news conference starts with Chairman Powell. Starts 8.30 Eastern time. So who does the halftime show? Come on. We do. It's us. <laughs> Here we go. Hi. TK's the entertainer. Right. He's going to yeah. sing. It's going to be fun. Really? Yeah. Tom's going to sing. He promised. He brought his uh, guitar in. He's brought his guitar in. We're going to get a little sing-song around the table. It's going to be a fake uh, bonfire nice, in the middle. Nice reunion. Mm. It'll last about two hours. And we'll do it all over again at the next meeting. It'll be fantastic, honestly. This is actually a pivotal moment because a lot of people have been basically trying to understand whether the weakness is the correct way to read the recent data or whether the strength is the correct way to read the data. And ultimately, it just depends on what the Fed thinks. And if the Fed thinks it's the weakness, well, how much does that shift where we are in markets It's right now? rare to see this on the same day to have inflation data, then in the afternoon have a Fed decision. And there are many people out there that believe the number we're about to see in 29 minutes will shape the projections we get at 2 p.m. and the tone of the news conference from Chairman Powell at 2.30. We'll see, but that's a view on Wall Street at the moment. It's difficult to sort of understand because they say that there has to be a cumulative number of data points. Nonetheless, we are looking at CPI. The last time that this happened, that we got the CPI print on the same day as a Fed decision was June of 2020. That is how long ago this has happened. It is a rare occurrence. Granted, they probably got the data yesterday, but it just highlights how whipsawed the market could become. First is the shot, and then the chaser, the Fed's response to the shot. Shot and chaser, a little bit later. Equity futures on the S&P 500, positive by 0.1%. These are the scores going into that inflation data. Yields almost unchanged, down about a basis point. The 10-year, 439.42. Lots to talk about on the euro side of the trade and the dollar side of the trade. Euro dollar, 107.63, trying to bounce after some euro weakness over the previous two days. Macron says he is not resigning, and maybe that's worth two-tenths of 1% on euro dollar. What this is all highlighted to me, and this week actually has been fascinating from this point of view, which is political risk and how it has had a huge influence on markets, even though people can't predict it and can't prepare for it. What we've seen in French banks, holy cow, yeah. their shares have dropped out of bed, 11% declines since Friday when you take a look at Societe Generale in France. So when you take a look at some of the moves, you wonder how much, how exposed are we to other risks? And how does the Fed kind of deal with that, given that policy does have an effect on growth, on inflation, and all the things that they're trying to uh, prepare for. A bit of weakness in U.S. banks as well yesterday, even though we did see those tech-driven 
All-time highs once again on the S&P and on the Nasdaq. Beneath the surface, financials were really weak, looking at Citi and the likes of JP Morgan. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with the former St. Louis Fed President, Jim Bullard, ahead of a CPI print and Fed rate decision. Bloomberg's Ira Jersey, as some bond traders abandoned bets on a Fed day rally. And Francis Donald, Emmanuel Life, reacting to the latest inflation print. We begin with our top story. CPI is about 26 minutes away. That inflation print coming as the FOMC's two-day meeting comes to a close, likely determining what the dot plot looks like going forward. The former St. Louis Fed president, Jim Bullard, saying he only sees one or two cuts on the table this year thanks to slow progress on inflation. Jim is with us here in New York. Jim, good morning to you. Good morning, good morning. Just fantastic to see you, sir. I want to talk about your dot plot from a long time ago. We all remember when it came out years ago and you said enough of this. You put your dot right at the bottom and left it there for the next couple of years. How do you approach the dot plot and how do you think these officials would approach it today? Yeah, I mean, at that time, I wanted to get the idea across that we had just switched to a low interest rate, low uh, uh, inflation regime, and that we were unlikely to break out of that regime uh, anytime soon. And so it was probably a better forecast just to say that you're going to stay in the regime. Now that the pandemic came along and, and uh, upended the global macro economy, uh, it looks like we're in a different regime now. Uh, so maybe it's a, it would be a different dot today. Well, let's play it. Do you think it would be post-GFC in reverse? Would you just leave it up there at 550 for a couple <clears throat> of years out? I think that's a little high. Um, I'd like to see the yield curve normalize here as the final piece of the soft landing. Uh, but I do think yields uh, will be higher going forward than anything we saw between 2009 and 2019. Do you think that the Fed is accurately reflecting that in their current projections? That rates will be higher for longer? Um, they've got their long run dot at 2.6. Uh, maybe that'll shift up a little today. Uh, I think uh, the idea that you're going to have that low of a policy rate, I don't know, that's that's getting harder, a harder story to tell, I think. Well, so Steve Rusciuto was on earlier, and he said essentially there's a real test of the Fed's credibility <clears throat> right now at a time where some people are saying that we're essentially going to vacillate between 2 and 3 percent in terms of inflation or even stay at 3 percent given the Fed's proclivity to cut rates in the near term. Do you agree with that, that essentially this is a 3% inflation target that just hasn't been enunciated by the Fed? No, the target is 2%. And if, if inflation stays above 2%, then uh, policy has to be at least mildly restrictive to try to push inflation back to 2% over a reasonable time horizon. But a key thing is what, what time horizon do you think uh, you know, it should take to get inflation back to target. And if you look at these projections, they're probably talking two years or something like that. So you got 80 basis points to go on core PC inflation. You know, you can do 40 basis points in one year, 40 basis points the next year. And so it's not, it's not the urgency that we had when inflation was much higher uh, just two years ago. Jim, when you're putting together these forecasts, how much collaboration is there? on the FOMC. Do you all go off, I'll go off into a corner and just sort of plot it down? Do you do it ahead of time? <laughs> pretty, that's it pretty much on the day? what it is. Uh, I have actually tried to call around to my colleagues and stuff, but it, it's very time consuming uh, to call everybody and they've got their own staffs and their own stories to tell. So it w works better just to give your own view. And, uh, and so there's a lot of communication by osmosis too. You, you kind of know what everybody's saying because you see them all the time and you hear their speeches and everything. Because we heard from someone yesterday that kind of implied, basically said, that for the Federal Reserve it would be better if the implied cuts this year, the median dot for 24, came down from three to two and not down to one. And Lisa and I were basically saying to that individual, well, what are you talking about? You're telling me that Chairman Powell's going to get on the phone and say, look guys, we need to massage this and collaborate and make sure the median dot just shows two cuts for this year and not one. That's not how it works, is it? No, uh, and people have strong views, so I don't think, uh, you know, they take their role very seriously on the committee and, and they're not really willing to say, you know, I'm going to compromise my view just because of, you know, something that might happen on that particular day. Yeah, but this does raise this question of how do you message it perfectly? Is there true consensus and what's the differential between consensus view and I dare say group think or, or, or something where, where people all sort of are coalescing around this idea that inflation is maybe a little bit higher, but not that much higher, that rates are restrictive, even though the economy keeps chugging along. 
Yeah, I think one thing to keep in mind about this is that the, the board staff serves the whole board of governors. So they kind of have this, they all see the same analysis and the same, uh, have the same projection. And then they may have a view relative to the, what the staff pr presents, and then they might deviate a little bit. But they don't have their own independent staff, whereas at the banks, all the banks have their own research teams, and they might have very different views from what uh, the board staff thinks. So, uh, so you know, the tendency for some of the dots to be clustered would be at the board of governors. You were <clears> on the <throat> Fed in 2020 when you were dealing with some of these yeah. issues, and that was the last time that we had a CPI print the same day as a Fed decision. Yeah, it's like a solar eclipse or something. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is, so we're staring into the sun, the political sun, and it's a solar eclipse. You're here for us. Uh, how much does it really alter the discussion? Yeah, I think uh, I would just caution viewers here and listeners that uh, what happens is on this day of the meeting, this meeting will start at nine o'clock this morning, the first thing that will happen is that the staff will come out and say, uh, here's what the CPI report said. And most people will know the number, at least the headline number at that point, but they'll give a brief analysis of that. But <clears throat> the only thing that will matter is, is it different from what the staff forecast? Uh, so did it come in hotter or colder than the, the staff forecast? If it came in about as expected, then the staff will say, well, this didn't change anything because we already expected this. So usually it's not big news at the, at the committee. It would have to be some you know, some blowout uh, difference. Do you think that it is correct that the balance of risks between inflation and a slowdown in growth is roughly balanced? Or do you think that it's more heavily weighted to one than the other? Well, inflation's been high, and uh, I think you want to finish the job here and get inflation back to target. So I think that's still job one. And labor market seems uh, pretty strong based on the uh, jobs report, you know, last Friday. and. Uh, other aspects of the economy seem pretty good. Atlanta Fed GDP now for the second quarter up over 3% at an annual rate. So it changes daily. It does. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think if you're just tracking and just trying to make a statement based on the data that you have in hand right now, uh, growth looks pretty good. Labor market looks pretty good. Inflation's still too high. Might as well stay a little bit hawkish. Uh, Jim, I've never seen people so skeptical of a 272 on payrolls as they were on Friday. Can you walk me through how you interpreted that economic data, both on the establishment survey and a household survey, and how you'd read into that? Because when you say maybe we need to be hawkish today, some people think based on that number Friday we should be dovish. I mean, how would you interpret that economic data? Yeah, uh, unemployment ticked up to 4%, and uh, that's interesting, but uh, it's still below pretty much everyone's estimate of the natural rate of unemployment. So they've been saying that, uh, we've been saying at the Fed that uh, you know, unemployment should probably be expected to run a little bit higher than it has, and a four, low fours or mid fours on the unemployment rate is a very good number still for the U.S., so, uh, and then on the headline number, uh, I was just thinking about this, so I plotted something that no one ever plots, which is the percent change year over year in non-farm payrolls. So if you look at that, a year ago you would have been at 2.5% growth year over year. Now you're at 1 and 3 quarters year over year. That might, so that does show the slowdown, uh, but the 1 and 3 quarters would still be faster than... Uh, so if you took that to be the run rate, we always go on the monthly number, which is so volatile. And, you know, how are we supposed to interpret this about uh, other measures of the economy? You will go on the year over year rate and that controls a little better for seasonality and stuff like that. We're lucky we've got you for the hour. Jim Bullard's going to be sticking with us for the next 45 minutes or so, working through that CPI data at 8.30 Eastern time. Equity futures right now on the S&P near session highs up by 0.15 percent with an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The EU has notified Chinese automakers of an additional round of tariffs on EV imports. The European Commission says that they will range from 17 percent for BYD to 38 percent for some other automakers and are expected to go into effect next month. The higher rates will also hit Western car makers like Tesla, who export their cars from China to Europe. Just moments ago, Volkswagen responded to the decision, saying that the negative effects outweigh potential benefits and that the timing is detrimental to currently weak EV demand. 
Elsewhere in Europe, French President Emmanuel Macron is calling on moderates to regroup to defeat the far right after Marine Le Pen's party won big in the EU parliamentary election. Macron addressed voters this morning for the first time since calling for a snap election. He said it is, quote, absurd to think that he will resign before his term ends in 2027. Meanwhile, yesterday, the French finance minister Bruno Le Maire said that if the far right wins, quote, a debt crisis is possible in France, a Liz Truss scenario is possible. Mexico's president-elect Claudia Scheinbaum attempted to ease investors' concerns, perhaps unsuccessfully, the peso weaker by another nearly 1.5% versus the dollar this morning. Scheinbaum spoke on Tuesday after her ruling party's landslide election win, which had sparked fear over unchecked reforms. Speaking at a news conference, she said, quote, investors don't have any reason to worry and added that the economy was stable. The currency is down now more than 10% versus the dollar since the June 2nd vote, by far the world's worst performance former over that period. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thanks for that. So just imagine this, the French finance minister, like the sitting finance minister, saying that a Liz Trust moment is possible. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem for a host of reasons, because you kind of aren't really raising any credibility in your currency and in, well, I guess currency is shared currency, but in your bond market, which is what you see it. I feel like Liz Trust moment, Trist, Liz Trust moment has to be codified in some way. Have like a little ghost. Like oh, across, across the screen? Yeah, across the screen. You Woo! want an emoji, yeah, yeah. something like that. This could be used more <laughs> Did, more did weigh on the currency for what it's worth, too. <laughs> there you go. You're right trying to bounce, 107.65. Up next on the programme, the Morning Calls Plus. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence as bond traders unwind bets for a Fed Day rally. That conversation is next from New York. Good morning. In many ways, the week begins in about 13 minutes, 8.30 CPI data. It is just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P 500 positive here by 0.15%. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Piper Sandler raising its price target on Oracle to 150. The firm highlighting its $12.5 billion in new AI contract signings, reaffirming Oracle's ability to capitalize on the generative AI wave. That stock is up by more than 7%. Next up, City raising its price target on Uber to 96. The analysts noting increasing use cases for Uber globally, maintaining the rideshare company as one of its top internet sector picks. That stock is firmer by 0.9%. And finally, Loop Capital lowering its price target on Paramount to 8 dollars the analyst citing the end of merger talks with Skydance, now expecting no transaction or takeover of any kind as the most likely scenario for the media giant. We're down there in the pre-market by 2.8%. CPI is the main event. It's just around the corner. Bond traders abandoning bets for a rally as today's double risk event kicks off in about 12 minutes' time. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now for more. Ira, Deutsche Bank's Alan Ruskin has been counting the meetings. We've had five consecutive meetings. Fed Day rallies at the front end of the yield curve. Ira, does that end today? Uh, well, it, it could, uh, although I suspect that the that, that the Fed is going to be, uh, you know, probably a little bit more middle of the road than, than maybe some others think. Um, you know, people do expect the dot plot to only show two cuts for the rest of the year instead of three. That seems to be uh, the growing consensus at this point. But um, quite frankly, I think that the bond market um, and the two year yields, three year uh, three year notes, they're going to be concentrated more on what uh, what the Fed says for 2025. Um, so we'll Will the Federal Reserve be, you know, somewhat more hawkish and maybe price out a uh, lower terminal rate and therefore, you know, maybe royal the front end of the market a little bit? So, like you say, it's possible that we sell off by day's end, especially if they are a little bit more, a uh, little bit more hawkish than people think. I rebuild on that a little bit more. It's something we heard from Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho as well. The 2024 isn't the most important thing here. They could go from three to two, maybe even to one. But ultimately, he said they'll just push that out to 2025. Is that what you're anticipating too? 
Well, I, I do think that when you look at the preponderance of the data, uh, it does seem like things are slowing, but they're uh, but they're not disastrous at this point. So, um, if a lot of members of the Federal Reserve and and the current members of the Board of Governors um, push up their their longer term dots, right? So, 2025, 26, and even that longer run is probably a little bit less important. But 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 you think about the the path of of the Fed. So, what what we've seen over the last couple of uh, last couple of months is we keep on pushing out when the Fed's going. To to start, but ultimately the terminal rate um, has also moved up, right? We went from thinking that the Fed was going to cut all the way down to 3% by 2026, and now that's come up, uh, you know, almost 100 basis points now. And if if that's the case, then you kind of do have to reprice the rest of the curve, because um, it, it's, especially if the market thinks that that's going to be realized. Um, of course, the, the Fed's dots are almost never realized, and, and I think that that's something that we have to get into the back of our head, is that, you know, that's their forecast, and they're just as good or bad at forecasting as just about everybody else. So, um, you know, will the market believe that the dots are going to be realized? And I think that that's where you can create some volatility. Um, I, I do think that they'll probably move those dots up a little bit. And I think that that's the reason why you might think that we'll, we'll get a little bit of a sell-off potentially, um, at least at two o'clock. Now, you know, Jay Powell can reverse that by being more dovish during the press conference, of course. And that's that's why we always have these double whammy days on, on at, at end of the Fed day. So, Ira, you like auctions, right? You like bond auctions. Were you watching yesterday's 10-year bond auction? Uh, absolutely. Okay, so what yeah. was your interpretation of the strength there? Was it because uh, there sort of was this feeling that maybe the CPI number would come in softer than expected, a greater disinflation than maybe is currently the consensus? Well, you know, I thought at first when I when I first saw that the, that the, the number was very strong that maybe dealers had set up pretty effectively for the auction, thinking that people would, that, that end users, so those are indirect investors when you look at the auction statistics, would stay away because it was right before both CPI and the Fed. Instead, you actually had indirects came in, like uh, had very strong demand. So end users, I think, m- might have been a little bit maybe underweight duration or, or short, uh, you know, in, in yield curve steepeners uh, by, by selling uh, tenure notes. And they used the, the uh, liquidity event that is a bond auction or a note auction, as in the case of yesterday, and uh, to to basically cover those positions before the Fed. And I think it was um, a little bit surprising that the market was seemed to have, have been leaning a bit short, and and that you had that that cover during the uh, during the auction. But it, it certainly was one of the strongest auctions of the cycle. Uh, in fact, I think there was only one bond auction basically in in early 2022 that was uh, even close to being this strong. Pretty solid. Ira, thank you. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence. The biggest difference, of course, between our forecast and their forecast is that their forecasts have big consequences sometimes. And whatever I think about the future kind of doesn't. Well, and they haven't been right for a lot of this, but they were actually more right about this year than the market was. And we have to keep reminding people of that because they kind of, you know, it's sort of running in, in place. It feels like that's what we've been doing in the market as we play this losing game. It's a great analogy. It makes me feel full of value. But there's this point going forward about, you know, uh, it, they've actually kind of been projecting not that many cuts, and that's kind of what's coming to fruition. The former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard around the table with us. Jim, Bill Dudley, former colleague of yours, and I'm sure a friend as well, wrote for Bloomberg Opinion in the last week that the Fed thinks it's finding inflation. Think again. Even at more than 5.25%, the central bank's short-term interest rate target might not be high enough to call the economy. If that was presented at the committee today, I could present it to you right now. How do you respond to that? No, I think, uh, I think the committee is restrictive, uh, and they do a lot of analysis on this. And I think the balance of the evidence is that, uh, that this is a pretty high interest rate for this economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can make arguments around it, and there are uncertainties around it, but I think they've looked at that six ways from Sunday, and so I think they think they're pretty much, uh, pretty much restrictive here. You have a lot of people who will argue... No, I'll say this. I'll Go say ahead. this about restrictiveness. If you think that last summer was the right number for the policy rate, five and three-eighths, and then core PC inflation comes down 200 basis points during the fall... How can five and three eight still be the right still be the right number with only eighty basis points to go to get to to get to uh, the two percent target? So that's a you know that's a a basic argument I think for that it's pretty restrictive. Some people would argue that it isn't because of the Fed funds rate that inflation has come down. It's different supply side responses. <clears throat> it's the uh, supply side shock when it comes to even the labor force, and it raises this question. First of all, do you agree with that? But second of all. 
how big of an impulse would it be to the economy then if the Fed lowered rates, if companies have been able to get credit, and if, frankly, the economy is doing just fine in terms of the current rate regime? Now, the, Fed ca the uh, inflation came down because of Fed credibility, and uh, it was really the moves in 2022, especially the four 75 basis point moves in a row. The Jackson Hole speech, uh, eight or nine minutes, uh, all it said was we're going to get inflation back to target. It's that and the subsequent moves after that that convinced markets that Fed, the Fed was serious about the 2% target. And there was a moment in the spring of 2022 where that was slipping away, that the confidence in the Fed was slipping away. But that definitely reestablished that confidence. And it paid handsome dividends in 2023 when inflation came down dramatically. So uh, now we're in a situation where, you know, core PC inflation on a 12-month basis, uh, Dallas Fed trim mean 12-month basis, those are all below 3% and hopefully heading lower. And so I think uh, it's been a really successful policy, and it's all about the Fed. There's the music. It's all about the Fed. It's all about CPI. Up next, five minutes away. The scores. Equity futures positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. We'll break down CPI with Michael McKee as we kick off a doubleheader. CPI before the Federal Reserve this afternoon. We'll catch up with Jim and Manulife's Francis Donald. All of that on the other side from New York City. This is Bloomberg. The whole trading week has been building up to this. CPI data due in about 20 seconds time. Equity futures on the S&P 500 going into that data. Positive by 0.1%. Similar move on the Nasdaq up by 0.15. The scores in the bond market, two year, 10 year, 30 year, look like this. Yields lower by a single basis point at the front end of the curve at 482.13. With the economic data, here's Mike McKee. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, John. Looks like further additional progress for the Fed. We'll have to get the data from uh, Jay Powell later, but uh, the CPI comes in de uh, up at, not at all, uh, flat for the headline number. The forecast was for a tenth. That's after three tenths last month. The uh, core comes in up 02, which is lower than the 03 that was anticipated. That puts the year over year numbers at 3.3% for the headline, down a tenth from 34 last month and 3.4% for the core on a year over year basis. That's two tenths lower than 36 uh, last month. So all in all, the headline numbers are pretty good. Let's take a look at what we're seeing in terms of some of the major categories here. Food up just a tenth. Food at home, which has been uh, sort of a campaign issue out there, 0.0. .0. So flat for food. For energy, uh, energy overall down 2%. Gasoline prices down 3.6%. And natural gas down 8 tenths of a percent. So good news there. New cars prices down half a percent. A lot of focus on used cars, which were up six tenths of a percent. But new cars have double the weighting in the CPI of used cars. So that's a significant drop. Uh, motor vehicle insurance, which has been rising and has been huge, goes down a tenth of a percent. Uh, and then for shelter, uh, up four tenths of a percent. Rent of primary residence, up four tenths, no change there. Owner's equivalent rent up four tenths. So the rent sides stay about where they have been for the last few months. Uh, no real progress there. The one thing I will say is if you look back to what Chris Waller was saying a couple of weeks ago, he has to look out to three digits to see what the real changes are in the CPI. And so we'll look for those as well. Mike, stay close. Let's get to it. It is the most important number in international finance. And right now, this is the right kind of downside surprise. Equity futures positive by 0.8% on the Nasdaq 100, up by one full percentage point. Check out the Russell, and then I'll give you the why. The small cap's up by 2.3%. Here's the why. Switch up the board and turn the page and get to the bond market. The two-year yield, absolutely ripping. Yields down by 14 basis points at the front end of the curve, 4.69. We haven't seen 5% at the front end of the curve since the Fed last met on the first day of May. We have backed away and we're backing away again. We're down 13 on 10s to 4.27 on 30s. We're down 10 to 4.43 
89. Switch at the board and get to foreign exchange. You can guess what the dollar's doing. The euro is stronger against the weaker dollar. We're back through 108. 108.22 and positive by three quarters of 1%. Lisa, stocks are up. Yields are lower. The dollar's weaker. That's the right kind of downside surprise. So now on to Act 2. How does Jay Powell interpret this? This is basically going to be opening the door to a July rate cut once again, because guess what? We're even closer to our goal. Looking forward, I think the reaction is fascinating in terms of what the connection is between the rate market and the stock market. It doesn't totally make sense that you see an outperformance of, say, tech stocks in addition to the Russell 2000. And there are some people who argue that, uh, that rate cuts won't benefit small caps as much as some other sectors. A lot of uncertainties as we carry through. You've always said first reaction isn't the way we're going to end the day. Uh, and that certainly could be the case today. However, the right kind of downside surprise definitely waiting, making its way to a pivot party once again. We'll see if it sticks. This is the first part of a two-part story. The next part is at 2 p.m. Eastern time when we get the Fed decision and forecast. 30 minutes after that, get a news conference with Chairman Powell. If you are just joining us, 0% month over month headline CPI. 0.1% was the estimate. Previous month was 0.3. Core, stripping out food and energy. In our survey, we were looking for 0.3. We got 0.2. Michael McKee has been pouring over the numbers over the last four minutes or so. Mike, what jumps out for you now? Well, one of the things, of course, that the Fed has been looking at is Supercore, which is uh, services less, uh, less energy. And Supercore comes in much lower than it has been at this point. Uh, it is up just uh, four-tenths of a percent for a month-over-month -month basis. And on a year-over-year -year basis, we're up 4.8 percent. Uh, that's down only fractionally. So there's still some inflation on the services side that the Fed is looking at. But some of the services things that we have been working worried about, like airfares, uh, have not gone up. As a matter of fact, airline fares down 3.6 percent. Your uh, surveillance co-anchor, Anne-Marie, probably got a discount on her trip to the G7. So, uh, so that's good news. So, Mike, can you give us a sense, as you're a Fed watcher and an econ watcher, how you think this is going to filter into what we hear later today? Well, I think it's going to probably reinforce what most of the uh, officials came into the meeting with, the idea that inflation is going to continue to fall. They may not have put uh, the exact numbers on it, but uh, I don't think this changes anything in terms of anybody's view of how many cuts they're going to put into their dot plot. Uh, it does make the idea of changing their forecast for the PCE, and remember CPI runs uh, a number of basis points above PCE, but changing that forecast, revising it, it up. Maybe that makes it a little bit more difficult. But uh, it's an interesting question for Jim Buller because he's been in that room. It's rare that we get data this important on the day of a Fed meeting. But I know they can change their views for the SEP and the dots up until about mid-morning. Jim Buller, the stage is yours. The floor is yours. What would you do <laughs> after that print? Uh, I think this was uh, good news for the committee. They've been looking for a softer report. They got it here, but the typical reaction would be, okay, this is good, but this is one month's numbers. We would need more news going in this direction in order to, uh, in order to forge ahead with our easing policy. So I think, uh, I think that will be the baseline reaction. Um, uh, but it does keep hope alive for uh, for those that have been looking for an earlier uh, rate cut. You think the door is open for July? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I think uh, the best you could do with July is set up uh, a possible move in September, and you'll have more data by the time you get there. Francis Donald and Manual Life alongside us as well. Francis, I want to get out to you and get your early reaction to that CPI print. I, I literally breathed a sigh of relief for a lot of reasons I suspect Chair Powell did too, uh, for consumers who are not going to see as much month over month increase in prices. For all the economists out there with a September rate cut in their forecast, they're probably also relieved. But also bigger picture, uh, higher rates are working to bring down inflation. This was an increasing concern. Uh, are, are rates restrictive enough? Do we keep them this high? Why is inflation not moving downward? That said, John, this is one print. We have three more before the September meeting. And as exciting as this is this morning for a few hours, I'm more interested on the CPI print that comes out September 11th, just one week before the Fed's September cut. That number may end up being much more important than this one. So we'll take it as a win. It's good news for consumers, for markets, for all. Uh, but it's one print. And we got a lot of information coming through today. Francis, Jim Bullard was also talking about the pain speech. 
in uh, Jackson Hole that Jay Powell gave a couple years ago when he said that essentially this is inflation that's running too hot and we are going to get inflation back down and it is going to require pain in the economy. Francis, you are expecting to see that pain. We haven't seen it on a broad base <coughs> level. Do you have a sense of whether this disinflation is the immaculate type that we've been talking about or whether this is just one dot in a series where things are kind of shifting, we're in a tipping point? I would hope that would be the outcome for the American people. At the same time, our leading economic indicators on the jobs front continue to show weakness ahead. We're at a 4% unemployment rate. I'm watching today to see from the Federal Reserve, they already had 4% penciled in for the end of this year. Are we really going to go through the next six months without an additional tick up in the unemployment rate? And let's remember the simple rule of thumb is that it takes about two years for those rate hikes to work their way through the system. And we're two years and some change after that first rate hike. We're not at the end of the impact of rate hikes. We're at the very beginning. So while magnitude of the downside for the U.S. economy is up for debate, the direction shouldn't be. There probably will be a much larger slowdown in jobs in the second half of the year. And this is when the Federal Reserve will have sufficient data to begin cutting interest rates and bringing those rates down uh, beginning, we think, in September. Jim, what, what's your take on that, given the fact that it seems like uh, something that, that feels like a stretch the, for uh, the unemployment rate to stay where it is for the foreseeable future? Uh, I think it is immaculate disinflation. And again, I think that, uh, you know, by being credible and moving quickly, uh, the Fed was able to uh, get firms to change their pricing strategies quickly. Uh, the inflation came down relatively quickly. And so, you know, one simple theory about how this works would be that uh, uh, you, the Fed threatens recession. Everyone looks ahead. They see that that might be a possibility. They don't want to raise prices into that. And, uh, and the inflation goes away relatively quickly. So uh, that isn't the most popular uh, theory around here or on Wall Street. But that is, uh, you know, that is something that you have to take into account because the anticipated effects uh, can overwhelm uh, sort of the mechanical effects and you get lower inflation right away. So this is something I was advocating for in 2022 that we, you know, let's move quickly. Let's try to quash the inflation quickly. And uh, this report today is helping, uh, helping that story. Forgive me for going off piece, but just entertain me for a moment. French tenure, yields down by about seven or eight basis points right now. That CPI print was more important to the European bond market than anything Macron's had to say in the last 12 hours. The banker to the world, the reason why Jay Powell should go on tour, but ultimately it does highlight how this is the market that everyone is watching, regardless of some of the external factors. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now for a little bit on this bond market. Ira, the most important data point in global finance. Your thoughts on this one? Yeah, obviously uh, better than some people had feared. Uh, yeah, you know, it was a, uh, on the core CPI, it was a low 0.2. Um, so it was actually under 0.2%. And I think that that's something that uh, uh, traders have been able to kind of grasp onto. And like you noted, uh, you know, this is pulling down, uh, you know, all global sovereign bonds at the moment where bond yields at the moment. So you look at German yields are down by six basis points, like you said, uh, France down by seven basis points. And, and uh, but, but remember, the beta to that is only half of what's going on here in the U.S., where you have five-year yields off 15 basis points at, at, at one point. And that, that just shows that, you know, you know we're now going to be pricing in for two full cuts probably before the end of the year. And then as you get additional data, obviously, the market's going to have to shift those expectations uh, pretty dramatically. So, Ira, I have a question for you. So the uh, if you just took uh, rebased where inflation is now and you said 0.2 uh, every report through the end of the year, you would get year over year core PC inflation on a 12 month basis at 2.8 at the end of the year. So you started out at 2.8 in January on that metric. We'd end up at 2.8. So maybe that's not really enough. You need, uh, you need even better reports in order to be able to show progress through, uh, through this year. What yeah, do you think I think, I think, I think part of it, um, James is is the 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 fact that we're you know not increasing right so so a couple of months ago when we had a couple of inflation scares the market really dragged onto that and said okay what happens if the Federal Reserve uh, doesn't cut at all this year or maybe even hikes because keep in mind in January the market was pricing for almost no chance of the the Fed uh, staying on hold this year and uh, and now we're actually pricing or were pricing I don't know where we are at the, the second but we were actually pricing 
pricing via options on short-term interest rate futures uh, for the about a 20% chance of uh, potential hikes by the end of the year. Um, I suspect that when you get if you get another print similar to this, where you have another call it 0.2 again um, on on the, the the core, that people will say like, hey, progress is being made. The Federal Reserve is still more likely to remain on hold and 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 or cut than they are to uh, to be even thinking about hiking interest rates before um, the you know June 2025 at this point. Um, so so I, I do think that there is a sea change and it matters. And and to your point, like um, you know, I I still think that the um, that that the market is going to say, okay, what's the trend versus where we were, as opposed to um, as opposed to just looking at okay, 0.2 forever is probably not going to be sustained. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, thanks for that. Appreciate it. If you are just joining us about 13, 14 minutes ago, we got this data, 0.0% month over month headline inflation against an estimate of 0.1, previous number 0.3, stripping out food and energy, Bramo, 0.2% was the number, 0.3 was the estimate. And Jim Bullard, a former St. Louis Fed president, just moments ago saying that this is the immaculate disinflation that many people were looking for. Francis Donald's still with us. And Francis, I'd love your take on that. Do you see this as as the, fran- uh, as the immaculate disinflation. Can you bet on that and arrange a portfolio around it? Well, for June, it feels like immaculate disinflation, or for May, we had this really large decline or no change in inflation month over month and a pretty good non-farm payrolls number. That's exactly what this immaculate disinflation would be defined as. So now it's about what do we see next? And on this front, Uh, I do see some downward momentum that is occurring in the economy. But let's remember, if you're sitting on a trading floor, you're managing portfolios, numbers like this aren't just about changing your base case. It's not that something like this would make you move from a December to November or even to a September rate cut. It can often be about reducing the balance of risks or the tails of the risks to your base case. So this number probably isn't going to change anyone's outlook as to what will happen next. That'll be based on their forecast. But it does reduce the chance that the Fed would if you had it in your scenarios, have to hike again or that they have to stay for a prolonged hold. So sometimes it's about reducing those fat tails on your outlook as opposed to the individual. That is tradable, but usually around the conviction of your trade or the balance of risks or how much leverage you're putting onto it as opposed to the trade itself. What could uh, Jay Powell say to Jay Francis that would really uh, move the needle in your book? Well, he could speak to some of his longer term concerns that aren't inflation or jobs. For example, uh, well, he can't do it, but uh, interest costs for the federal government are very high. They're about 19 percent of revenue is going towards interest costs. If he were to talk about and he probably wouldn't, some of the risks of higher for longer, that would move the dial. But we have three more inflation reports, three more of just about everything until we get to September. The Fed is in a holding period. The market is in a holding period. And each individual data point, each individual Fed commentary will be far less important than the sum of all of their parts. So as much as this meeting will get a lot of attention, I'm sure we'll talk about it all day. I'm far more interested about the evolution over the next three months. That will be more important than any singular event. Francis, one of the best. Thanks for being with us. Francis Donald there of Mania Life. Jim, Team September, City, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, they'll be feeling pretty good today. Do you think there's a risk here based on what you've said? I think maybe you do. Did we get too carried away with this print this morning? Oh, that always happens in markets. So, uh, again, I think this is one number. Uh, It is, uh, as Francis said, a sigh of relief uh, to some degree uh, because it's the previous reports that have not come in softer that have been causing the angst. And so this is... This is back on track uh, for uh, disinflation, and uh, but it is only one number. You're going to need more uh, more of this going forward, as Governor Waller uh, highlighted in his uh, recent speech. Okay, so that's the formal take. The informal take. <laughs> behind, <laughs> behind the scenes. You mean like the pretend the camera's not on? Yeah, yeah. pretend okay, the camera's not on and, and get in the room. How many of the Fed officials are saying, mission accomplished? Uh, no, they wouldn't say that. They're, Not they that loud. No, they wouldn't say that even to themselves. They would say, no, no, we need, uh, you know, it's good to have a good number, but uh, we get lots of numbers all, all the time, as you guys do too, and you can't put too much weight on any one read. Uh, but it's, uh, it's encouraging us going in the right direction. I'm sure Jay will say that at the press conference. Jim, you're going to stick with us. A final word from Jim. 
in just a moment. If you are just joining us again, inflation, the right kind of downside surprise coming in at 0% against an estimate of 0.1. Stripping out food and energy, we get 0.2. We were looking for 0.3. I'll get you more details on that in just a moment. I just wanted to run through the price action just briefly. Going into the opening bell, equity futures positive by 0.7% and a big rally in the bond market. Two-year yields down by about 13 basis points. Briefly breaking 470 on a two-year with their just there, right now. On a 10-year, we're down 11 basis points to about 429. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere, as well as some details on this CPI report. Here's Danny Berger for more. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. So that's the price action in the bond market. I want to go through what swaps are pricing at the moment. A full quarter point cut is what we now have in September, uh, November, about 20 basis points for September. And now a full two cuts for the entirety of the year. As you say, it came in flat for the month of May. And now we gear up for the Fed rate decision that is at 2 p.m. Eastern. Chair Jay Powell's news conference that will be 30 minutes later. Now elsewhere, U.S. mortgage applications rose for the first time in five weeks. Mortgage rates did ease closer to 7 percent. That's according to the data from Mortgage Bankers Association. Applications to buy a home increased by 8.6 percent. The data is, though, prone to swings around the holidays and the latest reporting week followed Memorial Day. The Biden administration is considering further restrictions on China's access to chip technology. Sources say that the measures being discussed would limit China's ability to use cutting edge chip hardware known as Gate All Around or GAA. It's unclear whether officials will make a final decision, the people said, emphasizing that they're still determining the scope of a potential rule. Companies like NVIDIA, Intel and AMD are looking to start mass producing semiconductors with this GAA design within the next year. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Thanks for this morning. Coming up on the program up next, we'll set you up for the day ahead, including a post-CPI Fed decision. Equity futures rallying hard as inflation starts to cool. Quite a market reaction. Equity futures positive by 0.8%. Big rally in the bond market. Yields much, much lower right the way through the curve. The two-year out to 30s on a 10-year maturity down 11 basis points. A break of 430, 429, 46. We're counting you down to the opening bound. That's about 38 minutes away. Here's your trading diary through today and the rest of the week. Today at 2 p.m., Fed rate decision and forecast are released. Then 30 minutes later, a Chairman Powell news conference tomorrow. Get some more data for you, plus another round of jobless claims too, alongside PPI. Friday, UMich consumer sentiment data, plus a BOJ rate decision. Jim Bullard, the former St. Louis Fed president and now dean of the business school at Purdue, boiler up. Paid to say that, Jim, by my own manager, actually, not by you. You literally are. Who is from Indiana. Uh, great to have you with us, Jim, over the last 50 minutes or so. Just a final word from you. What you're reflecting on based on what we've seen already this morning going into this Fed decision later on this afternoon. Yeah, this is good news for the Fed. Uh, the uh, policy is working. Uh, we're bringing inflation down. So I think all of that's good. It is just one number. Uh, we'll need a string of numbers going forward that will confirm this. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get that. I would just say something we haven't talked about is uh, bond market volatility. And uh, you had got a big reaction out of this number uh, today. Uh, I've described the last 15 months in the two year as Mr. Toad's wild ride. Uh, it's really been uh, very volatile and uh, uh, sentiment shifting back and forth about how soon the Fed will. So I think it would be behoove the, the US economy to get that to settle down maybe not be quite so dependent on, uh, on individual readings on, on numbers. But if we can get going on, uh, on the, uh, the rate declines in an organized way, I think that'll, that'll probably settle down. That volatility, is it a sign of the financial market strength that it hasn't taken you know, it down I don't, or just I, a point I, of fragility? I just, think, I just think inflation declined so rapidly in the second half of 2023 and in the way Fed policy works and markets work, you know, that got extrapolated out that that would continue and we'd be at uh, 2% by now, like right now, and then you'd have to lower rates a lot. Then you got these data that come in the Isn't other the way. Isn't the Fed responsible it's, for this volatility though? Isn't this the Fed? 
I, no, I think it's a combination of the Fed interacting uh, with the data as the data has come in. Uh, it was a surprise that uh, inflation went down so much, but then leveled out. I mean, maybe ahead of time you could have predicted that, but I, I didn't think. What's your best guess now? Let's finish on that. What is your best guess for this year and beyond based uh, on the small? Two rate cuts this year. Uh, based on where sitting here today, looking at this data, I think that's the most likely outcome. Any idea on the destination, the ultimate settling point? Uh, I, th I think I don't have a good model of it, but I think three and a half on the on the funds rate, and uh, and then uh, ten year trading at four and a half. Then you'd have a nice upward sloping yield curve. The soft landing would be complete. That's like the dream. Jim That's Bullard. the dream. <laughs> Jim, thank you, sir. The former St. Louis Fed president and now dean of the business school over at Purdue University. Coming up, fantastic lineup. TK is going to be just in that corner, away okay. from me, alongside Bramo and me. We're going to be catching up at 1.30 Eastern time. Here's your lineup. Special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom singing. The Fed decides. Like he'll be singing that as we come into the show, no doubt about it. We'll be joined by JP Morgan's Bob Michael, Julia Coronado of Macro Policy Perspectives. We'll catch up with KPMG's Diane Swank and Mohammed Al Arian. Fantastic lineup a little bit later. At a time of incredible volatility in the right direction, I guess, for the market today, when you take a look at how much the bond market has reacted, will it stick? after the press conference. Well, right now, this is what the move looks like. Equity futures positive by 0.8% on the S&P and quite a sizable bond market rally from New York City. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.